Yeah. That is also Andy Serkis. <laughs> well, true. <laughs> He's just playing every actor. <laughs> true. All actors are Andy Serkis. <laughs> I'm Ben McKenzie. Welcome to Pratchett, the monthly Terry Pratchett Book Club podcast. Each month, we discuss one of Terry Pratchett's books with a special guest. This month, we're discussing Jingo, or Ankhmore Pork Unleshed. <laughs> and our guest <laughs> is writer and psychologist in training, Craig Hildebrand Burke. Welcome, Craig. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Tell us about your Terry Pratchett fandom. Well, I used to read a lot in school, and then I went to boarding school, and I think I read all the books that I had, and I read most of the things in the library that. I was interested in, and then a teacher gave me Colour of Magic and just said, read that. And then I think I read all of his books during the course of that year. And I read them mainly just because I wanted to read them and I wanted something to read. But I think it wasn't until I got to Small Gods that it really kind of clicked for me and I just became very attached to the books and then proceeded to read them all as they came out. Yeah, and I think they the the big thing for me was they seemed to kind of straddle the books I was reading when I was a kid and then what I started to read as an adult, they're very much a kind of bridge between childhood reading and adult reading, I think, for me. Um, so that, that would have meant that you would have read Pyramids whilst in boarding school. mm mm-hmm. was, like, was that interesting or was it just... <laughs> yeah, that would, it sounds, <laughs> seems like that would be a scarring experience. Um, I, th- I think remembering Pyramids, it was one of those ones where I read it and I there were certain parts about it that I loved a lot, mainly The Assassins. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I latched onto the boarding too much. I was I grew up with boarding, so I sort of had it around me. So it wasn't until many years later that I looked back on it and realised what I'd gone through. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I think yeah, being in a in a religious school and having all of that really, you know, Small Gods was the one that kicked it off for me with a lot of the hypocrisy. Yeah, mm. and do you have a favourite? Any of the Watch books, but probably Night Watch. I would have to say. I also really love Monstrous Regiment, but I think Nightwatch is probably my favourite. Popular choice. Yeah. Because it's so good. It is very good. It's very good. It is not the book we're here to talk about today. (laughs) Uh, So we're sorry about that. (laughs) It is a watch book. It it is a watch book. It is very much a watch book. It is a watch book. Have you you reread any of them recently? Not very recently. Good Omens I probably reread relatively regularly, but Mm. um, the actual Discworld books I haven't looked at in a few years. Um, and so it was really interesting going back to it now, reading this one. And Jingo, out of all the watch books, I'd only read once. All the others I'd read multiple times. And I think because this one hadn't landed with me too well when I did read it. Um, but it was really fascinating going back to this, you know, 20 odd years later. Well, we're going to enjoy hearing your thoughts about it. No doubt. <laughs> yeah, I think it lands probably even harder now, or depending on what the analogy is. Like, It doesn't land comfortably, I don't think. No, no. But I think... That's partly by design, mm. even when it was written. Mm. But, yeah. but we'll see. Well, we should talk about it. Um, so let's start, as we always do, with a reading of the blurb. A weathercock has risen from the sea of Discworld, and suddenly you can tell which way the wind is blowing. A new land has surfaced, and so have old feuds. And as two armies march, Commander Vimes of Ankh-Morpork City Watch has got just a few hours to deal with a crime so big that there's no law against it. It's called... War. He's facing unpleasant foes who are out to get him, and that's just the people on his side. The enemy might be even worse, and his pocket disorganizer says he's got die under things to do today. But he'd better not, because the world's cleverest inventor and its most devious politician are on their way to the battlefield with a little package that's guaranteed to stop a battle. Discworld goes to war with armies of sardines, warriors, fishermen, squid, and at least one very camp follower. <laughs> Which is a good pun that does not appear in the actual book. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there you go. That's the longer blurb from the original hardcover edition. It's a bit different to mine, but mine also seems kind of long. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
but it okay. uses some of the same sentences, but in slightly different. Yeah, ways. they like they do like to remix the the blurb. Yeah. But I mean, once you put the effort in to write a good blurb, why you know don't waste that effort. You know, fiddle with it. <laughs> if you feel like you've got to change it, do a remix. It'll be fine. But it is it's an interesting spot in the in the Discworld series. Like we're right in the middle. This is the twenty first novel out of forty one. So mm. This is right in the center. It's hard to believe this is. I always feel like this is quite late because I started reading them probably around the same time you did, Craig, mm. quite early. So I was reading them as they were coming out at this stage. And so this still feels like a newer Discworld book to me, even though it is literally halfway. Yeah, I think the same for me in that this and, I mean, looking at the ones that came just before it, I think Feet of Clay probably for me marks the beginning of a run of books which felt to me at the time when I was reading them that they were all great and they were all kind of... Mm improvements or refinements on a lot of the ones that we got before which are a bit uneven and that's what i felt at the time i don't necessarily know if that holds up um but i think certainly the the next half a dozen or so books pretty much all the way up to um almost up to thud actually which was much later they you know i'd happily reread those over and over again mm. It's interesting what point it starts to feel like the new Discord books and the old ones to different people depending on where you started because like for me a new Discord book is going postal yeah yeah mm. well that feels very new it was <laughs> extraordinary me. like that just came out last week didn't it like, uh yeah. yeah i think so and it's weird it's it's i mean people feel the same way about tv shows and films it's it's all about when you encounter them as to what feels new and what feels old I yeah guess. the oc was 20 years ago it feels like that just came out douglas adams had some thoughts about this specifically how it applies to technologies I've come up with a set of rules, he said, that describe our reactions to technologies. One, anything that is in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary, and is just a natural part of the way the world works. Two, anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. Three, anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. Okay, so I've said this before, and I hate to say it with a psychologist in the room, but can I just... um it's very phallic imagery to begin with. Like it's literally everything is kicked off by a cock rising up <laughs> <laughs> out of the sea. Yeah, and then and it goes into the whole war and masculinity thing throughout, which is like a theme dotted throughout. Is that deliberate, or am I just looking for that? Uh, well, I mean, because it seems quite overt to me. I hadn't honestly thought about it. Uh, I was more fixated on the city itself because, of course, the first thing that happens is in the middle of the Circle Sea, this island of Leshp. Which is, which is a fun and slightly difficult name to say, uh, rises up. And, uh, yeah, look, it does have the weather vane or weather cock on the top. <laughs> it's specifically a weather cock it is, is what they say. It is. <laughs> and they talk about how that they're not even the most common ones that you get in Ankh-Morpork. pork. Yeah. So I feel like that's kind of like a comment, but it could just be. That's... Yeah. And look, given what we find out about the city later on, it's a little unusual as well. But mm. I don't know. What do we th- what do we think? Is this is just this to a, start things off on a sometimes a weathercock is just a weathercock? Is I, that what we I mean, to say? I hadn't thought of it that way, but I think in looking at the whole story in that way, you can definitely see there are certainly comments on the war that men do and you know, the choices that men make and being the right kind of man, certainly with Lord Rust, he seems to have an expectation of being a certain kind of man and that war is just a thing that you do mm. in that role. I don't know. It's yeah, yeah. Well, there's, uh, hmm. I mean, everyone seems to, well, a lot of people seem to have a very ready expectation of what is going to happen hmm. and a very ready set of opinions that come out of nowhere. Because, I mean, the, the first scene in the book is, is Lesh rising up and hmm. the fishermen from each country being there at the time. And the second scene in the book is, it's a few weeks later, everybody knows about it already. I, I was expecting there to be because I hadn't read it for so long, I'd forgotten, but I was expecting there to be a bit more preamble. And I'm like, oh, no, it's it's already happening. Okay, <laughs> There <great."> it is. <laughs> um, and it's, I mean, that's, but that's kind of how it is, isn't mm. it? People have these prejudices and thoughts already in their heads and it doesn't take much to, to set them off, unfortunately. So I feel like that felt very real, <laughs> yeah. particularly yeah. in our current climate. Um, it's just so the straw speak. that broke the camel's back. I was just waiting. Yes. Yes, Liz. Yes. I saw you raise your eyebrows yes. in glee as you said that. Yes, especially since I didn't intend to do it. But um, how do they know it's called Lesh? Well, because if it's risen before okay. and they have records of it, which is also evidenced by the fact that there's buildings on it that seem to have been added in the style of Ankh-Morpork and mm. Clatch. 
which is interesting. I mean, we find out more about it by the end of the book, but it's, I don't know. I, I it, It's got so many Cthulhu-y overtones. You know, this city rising from the sea with its weird architecture and its giant murals of squids. And you're just like, oh, there's something sinister. And I was actually, again, because I hadn't read it for so long and I didn't remember this one terribly well, I was waiting for something eldritch to happen. And it, it, it doesn't. And then there's that little bit at the end with the coda where they explain. Uh, and I'm like, oh, okay. That's, that's cute. I like that. But I'm, I'm bewildered. But it felt like at any point, like a moving picture was going to start playing and everyone was going to like descend into the depths and start yeah. watching it. But <laughs> yeah. the thing that really threw me, I think, about the name, though, was because the son of the, f- the fisherman who first is introduced is called Les. I'm like, is it named for him? Yeah, is this but a yeah. coincidence? Is he, and then I like looked up to see if the other son had the initials HP, but he does not. Yeah, no, I, I did note that as well. It mm. was a bit weird. Um, but it's, it, things very quickly escalate. Like, there's already a mob, people arguing in Sato Square, like, standing on... Uh, someone, I think, in the in the comments uh, on Twitter was talking about Sato Square being the Ankh-Morpork equivalent of Twitter, <laughs> uh, with people standing on their soapboxes and just shouting things. I mean, we still had that in Melbourne until fairly recently. People used to do that out the front of the State Library. Um, I think that's where it was. Like, they'd have this sort of get on, literally get on the soapboxes and shout things. I it don't was think also like do down, down the street, like near Collins, like in that city square. Is that mm. as well that you, where yeah. Occupy was for a while? Yeah, yeah. Where there's, you know, now a big hole in the ground because of the new train station that huh. they're building there. But yeah, you don't see it much anymore. Then there was a place in Sydney where people used to do it. I think actually they might still do it in one of the big gardens in Sydney, but it's not as common a thing anymore. Mm. I do feel like if they had Twitter, that's that's what would be happening. And there was a beautiful Python-esque scene, like where the guy's like, "Oh my, my boat of silks has been taken away." And oh, he yeah. gets like, <laughs> I got better. <laughs> it was just kind of. Oh uh, yeah, that was great. Yeah. Jenkins, who comes back later on, of course, although you don't know it at the time, but he's yeah. that was I enjoyed that a lot. Mm. Yeah. Um, but then we, you know, Vimes goes up to meet with the patrician, and there's all the lords of the city there, and they they're gung ho. They mm. want to. They, they're already thinking we've got to go to war over this. But the patrician's like, no, no, the prince is coming to talk to us. He sent his brother to speak to us. So, you know, we, we'll sort it out. But no one seems keen on sorting it out. Even now, even like, you know, I'm, in my edition, that's like 16 pages into the book. They're like, yeah, let's have a war. And you're like, wait a minute. Hold on. But yeah, it sadly rings true. And it's Vimes and Veterinary who are sitting there sort of quietly undermining all of the reasons as well because they're sort of pointing out all the differences and both of them make little comments, not overt ones, but little comments that sort of show, oh, well, maybe we're just as ridiculous or a bit silly to compare these things, which is, I think, good. But I don't understand why they don't say it. Well, I do because that's not how these things work. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's just a, I, I felt that it kicks off very quickly, do you think? Yeah, I think one of the things that I initially – really drew me to Terry Pratchett's books and that, you know, uh, I think w- they were really educative for me was how he plays with story and he plays with the expectations of story. And sometimes the story is there to help us, like to allow us to succeed in the end. Like I think Moving Pictures does that a lot. It's understanding the rules of the story and knowing how to, to win as a result of that. And other times it's a warning just because we've always told ourselves we should go to war just because, you know, we're running with the narrative that, you know, our neighbours who we're fighting with are are bad, that we're all kind of coming up with these prejudiced opinions about, like, people are just allowing the story to take over rather than Vimes and so on saying, hang on, you know, actually, I don't think we need to to tell this story. I don't think we need to do this. And this certainly seems to be the kind of novel where Pratchett is kind of warning against falling into the same old traps. Mm. Yeah, and there is that constant undermining. Like, it's Vimes and the Patrician at the start, but later on, particularly in a lot of the Colin and Nobby discussions, mm. Nobby's doing mm. it without necessarily even really intending to. It's very, it's very, it's never quite really <laughs> stated out whether he really understands what he's saying there or not or if he's just being like that sort of innocent genius <laughs> is questioning everything. Yeah, is he the innocent genius or is he like that brave cousin going into battle with like racist uncle at Christmas lunch? Yeah, yeah. Like, um, or, you know, writing that comment on somebody's Facebook post instead of just unfriending them or hiding it, yeah. you mm-hmm. know. But it, but he's doing it with 
it's sort of that innocence that lets him get away with it because mm. nobody's like, well, Colin is a bit like, are you are you taking the piss out of me? <laughs> but yeah. I was surprised at how blunt the Colin stuff was in the end because I'd forgotten how much he was like, he was like, no, white is clearly better. Like it's not even, mm. so he just like, he's like, we're better than the Clutch people. Yeah. Uh, although you get, you never really, I look for me, because I was sort of pre-warned of that. Some of the readers on uh, Twitter was were telling us about that and it's like, it's kind of disappointing. But as I was reading it, I was I never got the feeling that he really deeply believed those things. As in... Colin didn't believe him. He was yeah. just parroting them because that's the thing that he'd heard and he'd never like probed into yeah. into that. And cause, cause by the end of it, you know, when he's had, he, I mean, and it shouldn't have taken this for him, but by the end, you know, he's, they, they go back to that pub and he's like, well, I don't really want to mm. go here anymore. And you, you're kind of like, mm, did you ever really want to go here? Or did you sort of go? Cause it's, yeah, it was a bit, I don't know. What do we think about him? In yeah. This book? I mean, I didn't. Out of all of the the original Watch characters, you know, that had been there from the beginning, Colin was the one I'd never liked. I didn't really enjoy the things they had to do with him and often, you know, he's used as an example of what not to do. Mm -hmm. But he's really kind of foregrounded in this book a lot and I wasn't sure about that until the end. It's it's his opinions that I think are at stake here and his beliefs about the world, about what's going on with, you know, the kind of political climate that I think – Pratchett is really trying to speak to. He, he like he knows Vimes will do, in theory, the kind of morally good thing, mm. um, and you know that the like Rust is the other end of that. But I think Colin is the one placed in the middle of it, and and it's what he believes and what he thinks that's at stake here. But like as you were saying, you know, he's kind of doing it because he's always done it, and that you know they say that colin had had a broad education he'd been to the school of my dad always said the college of it stands to reason and was now a postgraduate student at the university of what some bloke in the pub told me yeah yeah so, yeah you know. i love that line that was amazing and i was like yeah that rings really true and he's often filled that role like i think in guards guards he's the one who most quickly is like yeah kings yeah mm. gotta have a king kings are great and then once it all goes wrong, he's like, mm, kings, no, we don't need them. Oh, he's a bit oblivious about the whole carrot situation, but he is he is kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, doesn't he make the same comment, I think, about the, the Clatchians where he says, you know, that they're all, always kind of clamoring for violence and yet they're, they're cowards and they'll run away at the first sign of it. Yeah. Like he mm. will contradict himself yeah. in the same conversation. It's exactly the sort of thing that Rust says as well. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rust, Rust is gross. I, it, it was interesting because I couldn't quite get rust's voice in my head there's a bit where quite early on it describes how he pronounces things it says he pronounced years as shars which gives you a very definite kind of voice you know it's 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 like mm, yes we we must uh, invade the um, the heathen barbarian hordes like it's sort of that very like sounding like the queen basically mm. with that extraordinary almost unique accent uh, which makes a mockery of the phrase the Queen's English because no one else speaks like that. But anyway, later on though, particularly given the things that he does during the war effort, I just, I just kept thinking of General Melchett from Blackadder Goes Forth. And I'm just picturing Stephen Fry doing his blustery mm. kind of, and you know, which I can't do the voice for, but it's, yeah. So I, he just, he more mutated into whatever form he needed to be to be that generic upper class idiot. Upper class twit of the year. Yeah. Uh, but he's not in the book very much, really, Rust. Just enough. No. Yeah, just enough to establish this is the guy that he, we don't want. Uh, yeah, he's, he's more in Vimes' suspicions. Mm. Is, you know, that's how he's present. He's a bogeyman. Of, of, like, was, as you were saying, he represents one end of a spectrum. Like, mm. Vimes is there to be like what's honourable and good. And then we've got Rust who's like, let's just go to war and let's just tear stuff up. And this is how things are and tradition and stodginess. Do you think he's called Rust because he's a corruption of things that should be pure and good? <laughs> yeah, could be. Or because, you know, you can't get rid of him. He's, he's rusted, rusted on. on. Yeah. And he's upper crust. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah so uh, I think all of those things make a lot of sense. Also, a fun thing that I liked, a reference from the meeting, was when they said that they didn't even have warships. The last one they had was the Mary Jane, which sunk like 400 years ago. And I was just wondering if that was a reference to the Mary Rose, the Tudor ship that sunk off Portsmouth in Henry VIII's era, oh. which had probably been resurfaced, because it got resurfaced in like the late 80s, so that would have been very much in his conscience. But I just thought that mm. was like a nice throwaway reference, just... Thank you for going to my mini TED talk about the Mary Rose, which I have visited <laughs> multiple times and is very interesting. Yeah. Well, look, I, I reckon probably, I mean, he does like to do 
that sort of research. The other thing when I was a teenager reading these books that I love so much about them was that intertextuality and that referencing of either other stories or other mm. historical events. And that apparently, yeah, the, the Mary Rose was the, the direct thing that he was commenting on. Because I you know, read these and then by the time I'd sort of finished that year of boarding, the sort of internet was taking off and that was what people did now. And, um, and I found the L-Space website, mm. um, which I then kind of just lived on every time I was reading a book because I just pour through the annotations and reading about all the different references and quotes and allusions to other particular things. And then I found other books to read. I found other things to come across that way. And so even if, you know, he talks about, you know, I think in the interview, he talks about the the white knowledge that he draws on that rather than white noise, it's that kind of things that you know, even though you don't know where you know them from. Mm. And so there, there would be things that I'd encounter in Terry Pratchett's books, which would be parodies of other of an original, which I wouldn't encounter until like in my adulthood, and then you get this very strange sensation of seeing the original after being very familiar with the parody. And yeah, but that was sort of my abiding memory from that part of my teenage years was learning about things through Terry Pratchett's books as a kind of gateway into broader cultural knowledge. Hmm. Um, hmm. The, I mean, the stupidest example of that was the in Good Omens. There's a joke about a quote in a James Joyce book which I then went and read. And then my mum saw I was reading it and then bought me another James Joyce book, which was Ulysses, which I then read without knowing what it was at you know a stupidly young age. And, and so somehow the only reason why I read James Joyce is because of Terry Pratchett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people would see a similar experience with The Simpsons mm. where yeah. they have so many parodies of so many things that particularly in the early seasons are stuff that people in their 30s at the time in the early 90s would know well. And now people like don't know the original, but they've seen them referenced yeah. in The Simpsons or, you know, in films. And I mean, there's a lot of things that are like that. And I think Pratchett's kind of unique in that he's doing that in print. Yeah. Mm. You know, you see it much more in visual media. Yeah. I was thinking about exactly that very thing in that there's a, a Simpsons quote for every situation. But for me, it was always a line or a, a moment in a Terry Pratchett book that you could kind of bring up at any point. And it was always applicable. And I yeah. think he's captured every single person at some point mm. yeah. in at least one of his books. So <laughs> It's true. It's true. But to get back to your point about Fred, though, he, he is that everyday person who yeah. I think is important to remember in any of these kind of discussions of big topics because they're the, there's, there's more of them. <laughs> I think it's something that we think about a lot at the moment where we feel a lot of us like we're in a bit of a bubble mm. where we talk mostly to people who agree with us politically and ethically. It feels hard to know... Who are these people who don't agree with us? The way that things are positioned for us to sort of factionalize and not engage with those people because we only see the people who are radical or who are, you know, so far on the other side of that continuum that we can't feel, we feel like we, there's no way we can reach them. Mm. But there's lots of people in the middle and mm. we don't see them or think about them as much. And I think Colin really represents those people in that he's got a message that has been very broadly broadcast and that's where his knowledge comes from but once he comes into contact with any kind of real experience he he you know rethinks it a little bit at least a bit and they're the people whose minds can be changed you're hoping to reach with messages like this but it's also i found it quite interesting because it is almost literally that reality show where they send racist people off to live like asylum seekers <laughs> oh yeah yeah like they put them on a boat they send them off like it's just like go it's, back to where you came from is that what it was called yeah. yeah yeah so it's pretty much that before that happened yeah wow hmm. i hadn't thought of that well look, we get we get through this meeting although look, there's some other stuff in this meeting that seems so relevant to us now which is amazing for a book that was written in 1997 mm. there's a whole discussion of how none of the you know they're like well, we, we could raise armies. We've got money. Mm. We're a rich nation. And like, yeah, except none of you pay any taxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and they all quickly especially, change the topic. So. Yeah. Especially the accountants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, they put in a claim. <laughs> yeah. They should be getting money back, which is, yeah, so relevant to our modern world. Uh, I mean, some of these things you're like, oh, is he being predictive? Or are these things just been a problem for so long and mm. still nothing has been done about it? <laughs> um, I mean, and that's depressing. Like when you think there's 22 years of how much tax has not been paid by all of the biggest companies and what could have been done with that money. Oh, let's not think about that too much. But it's in there. It's in the book. Then there's the disagreement about who's going to command the military and what 
the differences between, and again, this is something that's very relevant now, the military and the police, <laughs> where Vimes sees them as two very, very different things. And yet, you know, we see the constant militarization of the police in the United States. And now, as we're recording this, it's starting to happen here, where police in Victoria have just been given, you know, semi-automatic weapons to patrol the streets with. And you're like, why? <laughs> what do they possibly need those for and they even have that commentary later where like that he remembers why he doesn't have a sword he has a truncheon mm. yeah so yeah. that's still very pertinent yeah it's interesting because the person who bridges the gap i think well there's two of them because colin is explicitly said to have military experience in this book so he's been yeah. both and nobby has as well but which has been mentioned since they began yeah. yeah like there were ex-army guys who became watchmen yeah. but it's interesting that there's that mm. Yeah, and they both sort of explored, you know, for Colin, it's very much his worldview about racism and politics, whereas for Nobby, it's very different ideas that he's sort of encountering and broadening broadening his horizons on. Yeah. It was a weird thing because in this one, there was a lot of jokes that I recognize not from having read this, like pheasant pluckers. Mm. That's something I'd heard from outside. The footnote about Denise and Denephew, that's also like a joke that I'd heard previously. Yeah, right. And also as useful as an inflatable dartboard. So... Because usually, like, the, it feels like the jokes are coming from him, but these ones are from are plucked from the world. I think unless they were from him and then went into the world and then came back and seen that way. But I think that's not it. It's um, I'm not. It's not a criticism. It's just a point of difference. I think because in this book, I was kind of like, oh, that's like from that book of jokes I read as a child. Like, mm. yeah, yeah. No, I think I think you're right. He's drawing on some sort of folk jokes there for one of folk a better jokes. phrase <laughs> folk jokes is a terrible phrase folk comedy let's call it folk jokes is going to be a name of melbourne international <laughs> comedy festival show next year it's going to be great yeah i think you're right though i think he's drawing on those things and that's that's partly i think to make it feel like we're at home in more pork mm. it's meant to feel like us as in the you know the sort of western anglo style readers that we sort of are i think that's on purpose mm. yeah yeah i think the 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 jokes the references the some of the opinions of the characters they're kind of drawing from a smaller pool and it's sort of that british post-war and wartime kind of field of general cultural knowledge i think rather than a broad you know um, sort of spectrum of where he's pulling his ideas from they just seem to be coming from one kind of generation and one period of british history mm. Mm. which gets reflected I mean, because a lot of what you see happening now still draws on that idea of what culturally it means to be British or English, whereas not everybody agrees with that. I mean, and even <laughs> here, I think you see it a fair bit too in mm -hmm. Australia because of that kind of, well, nostalgia might not be the right word, but this feeling that this is how things should be because this is how I was told they should be when I was young. I think there's a there's a certain amount of that. And people are very nostalgic for times that did not actually really exist. Like mm. they've just like the Christmas card versions of eras without all of the problems. Yeah, yeah, um, and we all have that to a degree, mm. you know. It's just mm. that those of us who are a bit younger have it for the 1980s, <laughs> which mm. is which is not necessarily a, a whole lot better in some respects. So moving past the meeting, yeah. So after the meeting, the the upshot of which is, look, we're going to try for a diplomatic solution. Also, in which Vimes is informed that he is expected to help keep the peace through the watch, but also as commander of the watch, it's his job to be at the head of the procession when the foreign dignitary appears, because it's not just a meeting. The foreign dignitary is already on his way to Ankh-Morpork Pork because of the, I think, do they call it convivium at the university where he's going to be given... Uh, a, sweet Fanny Adams degree. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, an honorary <laughs> Sweet Fanny Adams degree, which was hilarious. <laughs> Very good. The fake Latin in this book is outstanding. I, and I was like, I was all ready to go looking it up, but they explained them all, which was mm. quite yeah. nice. Oh, that's good. That means everybody gets the joke. Did Terry Pratchett get given any honorary doctorates? Yeah. I think he would have. Would, yeah. would he, he have had gotten them before this book? No, I think it was after this. Uh, but he definitely did. I remember seeing photos of it at the time. Um, and we've also got, um, I can't gloss over Carrot doing his version of Boy Scouts with the, the street gangs. Oh, <laughs> the clam before the storm. Yeah. And they do like the wub wub <laughs> dub 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 and it's just so good. <laughs> it's so dumb but so great. <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot of really good sort of seeding of character moments which will pay off later. Mm. Um, mm. Like even even with Colin and Nobby going on about how the Clatchians invented zero and then putting Al in front of every word, which pays off in spades. Yeah. Mm. And that conversation, that's where you first get that 
hint of, like we were talking about earlier, Nobby gently poking back mm. at what Colin's saying and going, core. It also establishes that consistent thing that goes all the way through to the end of the book of Colin can never not have an answer. And this is such a toxic masculine thing to mm. do. It's like, I can't be seen to not know. Like, it's not okay to say, I don't know, or I'll have to ask somebody else. Um, and I think we've, we've all known people, mostly men like that, who have to have an answer for everything, mm-hmm. even if they're making it up. They have an opinion about everything that is quite often wrong, <laughs> wrong um, or ill-informed. But, yeah, um, but he he doesn't strike you as he's doing it out of any maliciousness. He just feels like he has to. Mm. He's a sponge for, like, the worst parts of society in that way. Yeah. And I think that's why he comes across he in this book as... a sponge. As, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he comes across in this book as quite sympathetic in that way, but I think still a bit gross. Yeah. Yeah. and I th- But I think, like, none of the racism or none of the prejudices that he because he's the main sort of spokesperson for all of that um Mm. it's never left unchecked and it's it's always every conversation he's in or every moment he's in when he's allowed to express these opinions there's always something that's deflating that opinion or kind of contradicting it and so we never just get unfettered you know yeah and it's not just in their conversations i think throughout whenever like a real nasty comment is made it is undercut with a showing why that is Mm -hmm. ridiculous yeah not okay, which is, I think, a strength of the book. Yeah. 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 And it's it's very different to, I mean, I, after our discussion about interesting times, it was quite interesting, for want of a better <laughs> word, to be comparing this depiction of another culture to that one. And in that one, like the other culture is depicting as having something deeply flawed and wrong with it, but it's never questioned because you've only got like a couple of representatives from outside of it and they're all just just saying what is you're all ridiculous this is nonsense and it was a very caricaturish representation of of another culture whereas this one kind of goes out of its way to take what previously had been a very vaguely sketched and drawing on a lot of stereotypes idea of clatch and fill it in a lot more Mm. make it a lot bigger Mm. Um, because in the early books it is used as a name for a continent and for a country and for a culture indiscriminately and interchangeably and in here we start to discover oh well that's because it is all of those things and it's a lot deeper than that and so as a reader you're kind of making that same discovery that colin has made during the events of the book so yeah that's pretty great i liked that but Mm. uh, it but it it does sort of it doesn't necessarily make the early books um better uh but it certainly is a much better approach Mm. Mm. So there's a couple of things that happen before we get to the convivium and the procession, which we can go through pretty quickly. Um, there's the hostage situation with Angua. It's just to show that she's tough. Yeah. Mm. Which we know. It's nice to see it in action. But mm. it's also similarly to how in Marvel comics they always said every issue could be somebody's first comic. I think Pratchett has that opinion. Yeah. It's like, well, every Discworld book could be somebody's first Discworld book. I need to establish who Angua is. Um, I found it surprising that Carrot is cool with making them clearly confess to crimes yeah. they didn't commit because that seems very out of character to me like he's very by the book but he's very on board with them just confessing to literally everything including like flashing that was clearly done not by them and so i just found that a surprise as a character There's, there is something about that terry pratchett actually responded to readers concerned about this he said the thieves had taken a watchman hostage which is a big no-no coppers the world over find their normally sunny dispositions cloud over when faced with this sort of thing and with people aiming things at them and perpetrators later tend to fall down self-stairs a lot. So Carrot is going to make them suffer. They're going to admit to all kinds of things, including things that everyone knows they could possibly not have done. What will happen next? Veterinary won't mind. Vimes will throw out half the charges at least and the rest will become TICs and probably will not hugely affect the sentencing. The thieves will be glad to get out of alive. Other thieves will be warned. By the rough and ready local standards, justice will have been served. So He's working by his greater morals. Yeah. And I think that if there is a point in this scene, it, it's it's kind of seeding that aspect of Carrot to, to play off later. Well, we also get now the scene where we find out how big the watch has gotten because now they yeah. have like something like 20 members, which is still doesn't seem that big, but it's a, it's a lot. It's more than three. Compared to, yeah, the earlier books. And we find out who a few of the more recent recruits are, including Red Shoe, mm. uh, the first, uh, well, second undead. Well, there's a lot of question marks over whether werewolves are undead or not. As we've previously said on this podcast, we think of them as doubly alive. Mm. Um, but uh, there's a zombie. Um, and also there's the first, uh, is he a gnome? 
Is buggy swine? Gnome or knoll? No. Is it gnome? Is it gnome? gnome yeah. There yeah. is a knoll in this book, which I was surprised by because I'd forgotten. Because um, Discworld knolls are That's not right. very much like Dungeons and Dragons knolls. <laughs> it's, they're made out of dirt, apparently. It's a very weird situation. But yeah, so we found out that it's got bigger. Dorfel's there, although he's very much in the background in this book. But he does get a, a gut punch of a cameo later, like for the alternate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's... Ooh. Oh, and we get that sort of little scene of our would-be assassin, Ozzy. Oh, yeah. We see mm. him in his room. Although we never... That's that's it. That's all we get of him. <laughs> like, that's our one glimpse into who he is. That's all you really need because I really liked how he was like, oh, yes, and his friends would call him a keeps-to-himself type, except that he has no friends. Yeah. And he was like, oh, you're going to die. Yeah. And doesn't even get a death visit scene. No. Is how... And death, death is really hardly in this book. Considering how many curries there are in this book. <laughs> you think he'd show up for yeah. them, right? And, and how many, actually, there's probably a lot more death in this book than yeah. actual characters dying. Yeah, that's true. Um, and yet death is only, I think he's only in it twice. Yeah, mm. and I was hoping that in he very would short scenes. keep like analog Siri, <laughs> but he did not. <laughs> no. Oh, and also uh, Angua has to have the, the chat with Nobby about his... Oh, yeah. Sexual nature. <laughs> uh, I would watch. I'd read a whole book of them having a partner thing where they have to solve a crime together. Like that would be bloody cop film. Maybe that's something that'll happen in, in the, the watch series. series. Yeah. That would be great. Mm. Yeah, they'll have to hang out a lot. Uh, I don't think. I don't think they've announced who's playing. They haven't cast a nobby, have they? No, not yet. I mean, they'll presumably be in them, but they haven't fully announced all of the casting. It's yet, probably anyway. Andy Circus wearing a green. <laughs> Green suit, like they could. I mean, look. I don't know if you've seen, the guy who plays him in the Hogfather movie really looks the part, but he also plays someone else and then really looks that part. So he's obviously just a very versatile Chameleon. actor. Well, yeah. That is also Andy Circus. Well, true. <laughs> he's just playing every other actor. <laughs> true. All actors are Andy Circus. Uh, he's a bit tall. I would have thought for Nobby. Nobby's supposed to be quite but short. You can shrink him. <laughs> That's that, why you cast he's him in a special suit. Oh right, yeah. Or you just use some perspective tricks, like he's much closer to the camera than everybody. <laughs> yeah, like in Lord of the Rings. Or much further away. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's also the the uh, the incident at the Goroffs. Mm. Oh yeah, that's very important. Just a straight up hate crime. Mm. Just somebody throws is it a burning coal or something like? I think or, it's like a Molotov cocktail. Yeah, it's because, basically like a homemade bomb. Because it's super dangerous. It's not just like oh, we're we're ang- not that it's okay, but it's not like a brick through the window. It's something that could have caused serious injury or loss of life. It's as in, a brick can do that too, but this has yeah, but more this is intention. Like the next and, level up. This is not just something I found on the street that I can throw at you. It's like I've prepared something dangerous. Yeah. So it's pretty full on. And yeah, it gets thrown through their window of a mundane, was it mundane meals? Yeah. Because he wanted a word that said everyday and ordinary. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's like a sensible sandwich shop. Yeah. And the watch responds again. This is like one of the parts of the book where you're like, this is too real. Like this is, mm. this has happened. This kind of thing. I think it was a really good thread having this family throughout because it puts a face on the, the small end as in like the day to day horrors of this kind of attitude because We've talked about how Colin has like racist attitudes, but he also seems like the kind of guy who have friends and be like, but you're okay. Yeah. Like he can be racist about a group, but he can't take that attitude and put it on an individual. And so I think putting individuals and putting a face on it is a good way of illustrating the difference or that there is no difference that you have. Like, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, he also criticizes particular culture on the food they eat and so on and then i think nobby says but you're eating this stuff all the time like yeah. he, he can make yeah very general broad assumptions but doesn't scrutinize the specifics when they apply to him yeah because they're not his opinions mm. they've just been superimposed so yeah can't it's interrogate the, them. this cultural narrative that he's just kind of going along with the yeah. whole way yeah See, I thought this family because we we track them through the whole book they're like it's them specifically rather than different examples that means you can get attached to them And I think it was quite a sad story, really. Yeah, yeah, because they have a rough time of it. You know, they have their shop attacked. That puts the sun on edge so that when someone comes barreling into the store later in the plot, he reacts and tries to shoot them with their really bad crossbow Mm -hmm. and thankfully doesn't kill them. But then they invite them to the watch house to keep them safe, basically. And then another person comes in and is like, you've locked up my countrymen. And then so they are just the different points of escalation mm. happens to them and it's just you know. and then the son ends up conscripted into the army and he doesn't even want to be there and because he yeah. was born in ankh mm. even though he gets sent back to clatch and yeah. then 
It's also one of the points where Vimes catches himself doing a bit of a colon, you know, because there's the bit where Mr. Goroff speaks more porky and, and he's like, oh, you speak. And then he catches himself and he's like, oh, no, you've been here for years. Of course you do. That's mm. a dumb thing to say. Mm. It's useful in that regard as well because Vimes, we think about Vimes as being always on the side of what's right and just, but even he is not immune to those cultural ideas of what immigrants are like, for example, you mm. know, which is an idea that floats around in our culture and, and you can't avoid bumping into it and you do have to pull yourself up on it. Like none of us are immune to those ideas. We have to be challenging them and sometimes that doesn't happen in the safety of our own home. It happens mm. when you're out and suddenly you encounter them and you don't, wait a minute, I'm thinking something that I understand is not correct. Mm. I've got to adjust myself here. Yeah, I think Vi- Vimes sort of consciously is aware of his limitations and as he evolves and you know every book every time we meet him he's moving from one position in the past to, to something you know better um and whereas i think colin is this this unconscious changing throughout and so mm. the two are there's a similarity to what's going on but in in very different ways mm. i think pratchett himself kind of does that as mm. well because i mean this feels like an evolution of something like men at arms where the racial tensions are depicted as non-human types like it's all about trolls and dwarves whereas here he's gone we should probably talk about that a bit more directly yeah. mm. because it's very easy to look at that and go well they're trolls and they're dwarves and they actually are different to us on a you know cellular and in some cases chemical level but we're, we're really talking about through that allegory as people and people so let's talk about that more directly and get to the nuance of it a bit more yeah the, i think the thing that really caught me particularly on this read through which i had not at all remembered i think what immediately following the scene at the garfs where Colin is just mouthing off in particularly racist ways and Vimes calls him into his office and mm. it's never explained but it's quite clear that he's ticking him off and saying, you know, you, you can't talk like this, you can't you know, be so blatantly racist and Colin doesn't get it, he doesn't understand why. Yeah. But mm. you sort of, yeah, I think I, I read over that passage a couple of times just to try and see how clear he was being with it but it's quite straightforward yeah. about where Pratchett is situating himself in terms of this book and what he's trying to do. Mm. No one really gets away with having a bad attitude. Mm. Yeah. Like it's yeah. never condoned. Yeah, which is always quite important. Yeah. Finally, we get to the, the convivium itself. And Vimes is supposed to lead the procession. Before the procession starts, there's a lot of hobnobbing to be done. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case, without corporal knobs, <laughs> which is probably <laughs> for the best. Um, I think you mean Cecil. <laughs> Cecil, yes. We do learn his full first name in this book. That's weird, isn't it? Oof. No uh, offense to Cecil's out there, but... I, it's real Cecil vibes. I do think we actually, maybe we do earn his name in Feet of Clay when they, because at some point they give his full name. But in this one, it's it's weird to hear him actually use it. Because he's getting it ready for his dating profile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he would, oh, he would so be on Tinder. Yeah. Oh. And his age range would be wide, I think. I was going yeah. to be like, oh no, he's only going to, but I was like, no, he'd be. I don't know, because he has all that stuff. Like, he, he criticizes all the women that Angua puts forward for him. So I can't decide if he'd be. Well, by the end of the book. By the end of the book, but yeah. at that point. But back to the schmooze. Back to the schmooze. The schmoozing going on. Um, we meet some very important characters. Yeah. And I think it's very good because it also, as readers, we don't know what Clatchians are really like other than the Garus, which we've just met. And so we meet the prince, and he's just taking the piss out of everyone. Yeah. And it's just a delight to read. Mm. He's, he's the best. I love the <laughs> prince. I wish he was in the book a bit more. Yeah. Like, I, think, I get why he's not. It's quite important to the plot, but... Yeah, he was he was a great character. Yeah, he just he's there like probing at people's racism throughout, and it's just great. And then was it seventy one hour? I got seventy one hour Ahmed. Yeah, mm. yeah, he's just also such a great character, and they're both introduced in such a short period of time. And then they have to go on this procession, and it was just like sports day at school all over again with all the ridiculous costumes and yeah. silly traditions. And he's kept all of the terms that he invented for Clatch earlier, which, you know, in isolation were maybe a bit much like offendy instead of mm. offendy or, and stuff like that. But it's with the broader context, you're like, oh, I don't mind that so much now. Like mm. this, this, it kind of works. But also there's that great bit. I think the thing that really sells this scene for me is the bit where the prince asks him, oh, yeah, someone called me a towel head. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. And nobody else is willing to explain it to him. And Vimes is just like, it's an insult. Mm. And he's like, ah, very good. You're the only person who would tell me that. Well, I, I mean, I also got that he knows it's an insult yeah. and he's just yeah. wanting someone to, to state it. And he said, yeah, now you can see what I've been putting up with the whole time. 
Yeah. It's like when someone makes like a sexist joke or something and the the strategy that's been put forward is to ask them to explain why it's funny. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of that. And you know, he's in a bit of a, he's an interesting position because, you know, he hasn't made the joke mm. or the insult, but he's being asked to explain it. Mm. And you can sort of see, I'm imagining Lord Downey being asked that question, you know. <laughs> but you'd think twice, like if you were someone who used terms like that and then you, someone who'd been abused with terms like that said mm. that to you, you'd think twice about doing it again in future because yeah, it's just so. so awkward. Like, And that's kind of why that seems mm. so great. And it's also effectively asking Vimes to front up for other people's bias and other people's prejudice and racism, which is saying, well, you might not have done this, but you're a part of this group who represent these ideas which I have to encounter on a daily basis, so now you answer for them, which is a good kind of turning of the tables. Yeah. Mm. So. It's a great scene. There's much nonsense. <laughs> um, the traditional lighting of the cigar. Yeah, which is great. During the procession, Vimes catches light of something because they, they have checked the route of the procession beforehand to make sure that it's all safe. It's a very JFK assassination kind of vibe, this bit of the book. Oh, and continuing, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, just as the procession is going, though, Vimes, after slowing down <laughs> into his traditional policeman's beat sort of walk, spots someone on the top of the Barbican which is a building that no one should be able to get into, and runs off to try and catch them. Carrot also runs off. Uh, Angua runs off. Um, but they are unable to prevent the prince being shot with mm. an arrow. This is a real kickoff point of the book because it kicks off the whole investigation into who has done this and why, which very quickly becomes an investigation that clearly shows someone is framing somebody else for the murder. Our, our man Ozzy does not survive the assassination attempt. He falls off the tower. Again, JFK vibes, there was a second Bowman, <laughs> you yeah. know, who was the accurate one because it becomes fairly clear that Ozzy could never have hit anybody. Yeah. And yeah. the grassy knoll. Mm. There is a grassy knoll. Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely a grassy knoll. I oh. can't believe I didn't spot that. Uh, but yes, there absolutely is. Oh, my God. Uh, and there's a, the talk of a magic bullet as well. Well, a magic arrow. Yeah, and a very kind of Zapruderish, like, let's look at the photograph and try and restage it and see where it doesn't line up. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was nice as part of that to have a negation tourist like, just pop up as a thing. I was like, oh, that's still mm. happening. That's nice. Yeah. But this becomes the catalyst for the war actually beginning because the peace talks that are supposed to go on do not go on. And it escalates. It gets worse. The lords are all like, this is terrible. Who would do this? But there's very much feeling that this was planned. Um, but by who? But by whom? Who has set this up? It, it's interesting because there's like a three deep layer of what's going on because... Mm. It's just like a wall of herrings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we know who did it. Obviously thought he was doing it, mm. but didn't. There was the second woman who we eventually find out is Snowy Slopes, <laughs> the, uh, who's not an assassin. He's just a paid killer. With um, dandruff. With a lot of dandruff, hence his nickname, who did the deed, but then has his head removed. But there's also evidence left that really suggests that Ozzy was paid by Clatchians to do it. But it suggests it's, that they want to suggest that. bad evidence. Yeah, yeah, but it's bad evidence. And so the watch is really not sure what the hell to do with any of this. It's like sand on the floor. Yeah. And like, so, and finds big... that great line of like, oh, so they've still got sand in their sandals. Like, <laughs> from all that way. Yeah. <laughs> it makes no sense. The, and the big crate of Clatchian money. I'm like, what a giveaway. <laughs> I mean, by the end of the book, you find out what all that is about. But in the meantime, mm. it's a bit like, where is this going? It is a bit confusing. Not in the sense that you're fooled by that evidence, but more in the sense that you're like, who's put it there? Mm. Like, is it Lord Rust? And then, you, But you kind of think, Lord Rust is not smart enough for this. <laughs> He's an idiot. It had been a long time since I'd read it, and I was kind of like, did the prince do it? Because they, they bustle him off to the to the embassy, and I was like, maybe he's not even shot. Maybe he's like the one doing all this. Well, there's bad evidence and then there's other evidence with the pad where something's mm. clearly been written oh, on yeah. and then the little clove that's sort of wedged between the floorboards, I think. Yeah, so there's a few things. And even those things have been left deliberately, but they're mm. like that extra layer of maybe you'll figure this out. Mm. Fimes goes to see Vetinari after this. He's like, this is probably not going to work out because Fimes is like, look, I don't think this is what's going on. And, and Vetinari's like, doesn't matter. Like people can argue with anything, even the truth. Again, very relevant in our modern age. Mm. After which, Venai goes to see a certain person who lives in a secret compartment somewhere in the palace. And um, the scenes are so good. I know. Leonard of Quirm is back. And this time he's he's got quite a big role. But haven't you just noticed the way that dew falls on a rose petal? And it also hears my drawing of a war machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
He's such a... Oh, I love him. He's it's such a lovable soul. character who just wreaks potentially so much death and destruction upon the world. I think this book is the point where he suddenly realises, I can't keep doing this because he destroys his own work in this book rather than let it get out there. And this is the end of his innocence, unfortunately, mm. which is very sad. But he continues his tradition of not being able to name things well, <laughs> which, is, which is great. Because he's kind of like one of those squid from the beginning of the book. The curious squid. Yeah, he's like that, but one that has seen the other side and goes back down and lives a lonely squid life. Yeah, by choice. Yeah. I mean, there's the obvious parallel with Da Vinci, but mm. it's like an easy parody to say, well, he's the guy who never finished anything and he just kind of idly sort of doodled away these genius level kind of designs, but he didn't really care for them. But I think, you know, there was a story with Da Vinci where he was paid to design this amazing sculpture and I think he was making it out of brass and he was fully committed and he invented this new way of casting the metal and everything and it got to the point where they were going to make it and then the project got taken away from him because they were going to use all all the metal for new cannons so they could go off and fight a war. Hmm. Here's your art, but we're going to turn it into something destructive. Hmm. That happened of- with that the Hachiko statue in Japan, mm. like the, of the dog that waited by its owner's grave, and they did a statue of it. But the original statue apparently got melted down for the war effort, and oh, they've gee. built a new. But I think the artist's son or grandson made the new one. Hmm. Oh, he's the best. Yeah. Hachiko. Ultimate good boy. And another ultimate good boy is Leonard of Quirm. He just <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate good boy Leonard of Quirm. <laughs> yeah. Now that sounds like that sounds like a swamp dragon breeding name. <laughs> uh, but he is uh he's great. I love him. One of the things I love about this is that the, the first meeting, the patrician doesn't go to him to like find out about stuff. He just likes talking to him because mm. he's very smart, but he doesn't understand any of the stuff that he's talking <laughs> about. So he quite enjoys the conversations and he likes leafing through his pictures and he's just sort of like going, oh, I just thought I'd check. You know, you don't have any relatives in Clash, do you? Mm. And then uh, he talks about Lesh and uh, yeah. and he just makes that offhand comment. Oh, yeah, I did a few sketches there once and uh, then the patrician leaves. And then he comes back the way he again. Comes back. Yeah, and he's like, just- you did what? <laughs> but the description is just so, like, he's do- he's coming back so ungainly, yeah. which is not his way. It sounded like someone running, but also occasionally pausing to hop sideways on one leg. Yeah, <laughs> avoid all the death traps. Yeah. Oh, it's, oh, it's great. But then shortly after that, the patrician steps down while is, the investigation is, he st- is going on. Is he sort of like preemptively stepping down before he's like forced to because... Uh, yes, it does seem to be Making moves. But it's also, I mean, by the time you get to the end, and it frustrated me reading it this time, if you knew exactly what he was doing, then that storyline would make sense. But because you kind of kept at arm's length from his motivations, mm. you just expect it to be sort of interested in everything else that they're doing. But knowing then what that storyline is about and where it ends up, it's clear that he knows this from this point on and that he's just going there to confirm a hypothesis so he can well, kind of bring things to an end. Well, yes, except that the way they talk about how often Lesh rises, which is what we're talking about, mm. I get the impression that Leonard didn't go there while it was above the sea. Yeah, no, he So would... they don't know that it's going to rise. And think it's... I suspect like he, he suspects that it's going to sink again and then he's going to confirm it. But like, when does he draw up the paperwork? Because he, that's all done... And in tubes as preserved. So is that like he's done that before he leaves the palace? Or does he do that after he's confirmed what he thinks about Lesh? Yeah, possibly. So, I mean, I think I think he goes without fully knowing what he's, he's going to find. Mm. But thinking that if there's a way to visit and see what's going on there, then... But maybe. I mean, maybe even whilst visiting it last time, Leonard figured out what was going to happen. Who knows? Well, if he looked at Leonard's drawings and... Maybe he would have seen the thing that you described earlier of the different buildings from different places on there and figured out the history from that context. Mm. Yeah, well, that could be true too. Yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't seem like he would resign without knowing that it wouldn't matter in the end. That he. Oh, I think that's definitely yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know that he necessarily. Yeah, well, maybe you might be right there. I guess I felt like he wasn't sure what was going on with Lesh, but that he was sure he could figure out some way to make it work. Yeah. Well, I think that's why he yeah. goes there first and not straight to Clatch because he needs to be sure. But I have a question, like jumping forward a bit. If he's stepped down as patrician, does he have the authority to sign these papers on behalf of Ankh Morpork? Because technically he's just a civilian now, isn't he? Well, I but mean... Then, but then he's like... But he never says that Like when he's there, he's the patrician. But if he's stepped down, mm. but is it just like he's the patrician but he's not in charge? 
Maybe it's a bit like the end of Game of Thrones. I haven't seen it, so I cannot comment. It'd make you angry. Sure. Is the main thing you need okay. to no, Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things happen while the patrician's getting ready to bugger off, basically. This is where we have the escalation with the Goroths, where mm-hmm. the Goroths' son accidentally shoots somebody and they decide to move them into the watch house to keep them safe. It turns out the only place they've got to put them is in the cells. But Colin the puts them there. But the door's open and they've got a warm blanket, so they're all right. Um, a man comes in to be like, I hear you have my countrymen locked up. Mm. And then he, they explain to him that they're not locked up. He needs to see for himself. And then they end up punching on, and that's a good foreshadowing of what's happening over in Clatch and the main motivation for all events. Mm. Mm. So, which I, I sort of went, oh, that's weird. And then just moved on. And I was like, oh, hang on. That's giving us a glimpse of what's really happening. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it like that. There's, it's it's kind of the, I mean, it's a very, very veiled nod for me, but the increasing amount of Lawrence of Arabia references. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> this, you know, idea of these warring tribes and factions that are trying to be united under some kind of effort, but it's also an effort that is not entirely good natured. To, mm. to unite these disparate people. But this, yeah, I guess it's the first little clue that that's the direction they're heading in. Yeah. Because I just dropped a line earlier about the other prince who's doing good work in the small villages and then it gets cut off. They're like, no, no, it's his brother coming. So, like, they've dotted hints. Mm. Yeah. Also, this is where the fire at the embassy happens, which is a big deal. I love <laughs> the bit where Cheery comes to see Vimes. And he's like, I suppose you're going to tell me that the Clatchett Embassy is on fire next. Don't, don't tell me that. And she sort of stands there awkwardly, going, not sure what to say. I was a bit like, I love seeing Cheery in this book, mm. but I was a bit sad she didn't have more to do. But it's, 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 this is always the case with any story where you get too many characters, not too many, but you have a large cast of characters. There's never going to be enough for them all to do. They're just going to be there. And some of them get foregrounded and some of them are in the mm. background. And in this book, it is, as we say, it's very much about, the, the original Watch characters, so mm. Nobby and uh, Colin and Vimes, and to a lesser extent, but still quite a bit, Carrot, and a, a little bit, but not as much, Angua. They all have the sort of starring roles. The other Watch members are very much supporting characters in this book. But Cheery does get a few great moments, and that was one of them. <laughs> She's just awkward about it. <laughs> and they have that great commentary um, about why they don't have a firefighting force in Ankh-Morpork because oh, the people yeah. are too crap like they'll just light fires to put them out and so because of all the terrible sentiment the volunteer fire force isn't helping the clatchian embassy fire they're just watching it happen Mm. yeah which is it was uncomfortable in the context of australia's fires at the moment but i mean that's uncomfortable in general yeah kind of gross but it but you know the vimes is showing up and it's like why aren't you doing anything um there's that one i do remember though there's that one like little kid who's got a bucket yeah but he's he's like and they're saying like they wouldn't let me and you're like Oh, his instinct was to do something good, but the attitude of the crowd has made him quash that. Oh, I kind of felt like, you know, you can't form a bucket chain of one person. It's kind of how I was reading that. And so he'd like brought a bucket and then no one would help him. My favorite bucket chain, Ank Morpork one, is the, the fool's killed. I don't remember what book it is, but they're trying to put out a fire, but they can't <laughs> find their instinct for a slapstick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's in men at arms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think about that a lot. Oh, no. But Vimes runs into the embassy grounds, uh, but he has to punch a couple of the guards to do it because it's, as is traditional, supposedly. I don't know if this is true in the real world, but it, it, the embassy is considered foreign soil and like mm. it's part of the nation who they represent, which I think is, I think that is true. I'm, I'm not really I've sure. I've heard it. Yeah, whether whether that makes it true or not. Yeah, well, it's a, you know, we've got we've got our diploma from that thing we heard from a <laughs> yes. guy in the pub that time. <laughs> but yeah, it's certainly true in Ang Morpork. He has to punch them to let him in. Uh because they don't seem to be fighting the fire themselves either. There's people coming out of the building with bits of paper, which becomes important later on. Somebody appears mysteriously clad, uh, helping Vimes uh as he rushes in because he can tell there's still some people inside. And in particular, there's a, a woman who's in bed somewhere and there's another person in there. And he helps to save them before being passed out. And it was quite an action-packed scene. And I think it's one of those things that it was fun at the time because it's like, wow, look at all this stuff that's happening. And it's a bit of a mystery. Who's this person and what's going on? And then later on, it becomes very satisfying because you're like, oh, I see what was happening there. And particularly the, the bit where someone complains to the, the guy who's got all the papers coming out. I thought that was great because later on you find out what that's about. The scene with the fire is planting more of a scene, you know, with Vimes' suspicions initially with Rust, but now with 71 Hour Ahmed. 
because the book is so linear and because it's this, this chase in this one direction, mm. there isn't much time to pause and, and reflect. And so he just has these hunches and these suspicions and then we just follow up with them. So he knows that there's something going on with 71 Hour Ahmed and he knows it ties into everything he's looking at, but we don't get any time to sort of pause and piece together these these sort of disparate clues. Mm. Yeah, and in fact Vimes only has a very brief moment to do that and I think it's just after the fire or just before where he says, you know, the man we know didn't get the princess dead, the man who probably did is dead. Someone tried very clumsily to make it look as if Ozzy was paid by the Clatchians. I can see why someone might want to do that. That's what Fred calls politics. <laughs> and, you know, and, and there's also that bit early in the book where he's put Nobby and Colin on the job because they will find all the obvious clues mm. and just accept them mm. because they're not detectives. <laughs> you know, they just want to have a nice life. It's, no, it's never quite clear. Well, I mean, Fred does want to retire in Feet of Clay, but then by the end of it has changed his mind because he doesn't want to ever go near a farm again <laughs> after being almost trampled by a variety <laughs> of farm animals. I think he'd do badly spending a lot of time with his wife too. It does seem it, that way. Because they've got that relationship that they've talked about previously where like they've ships in the night, they have opposing shifts, she leaves out some sandwiches for him, it's great. Yeah. It's like in Heartbeat, the running joke of Alf Ventress, like the older policeman there. He always talks about Mrs. Ventress and I don't think you ever see her to joke throughout. Oh. Like you see all the other characters, but they always talk about Mrs. Ventress. I mean, that also happens with Vimes, certainly in the first half of the book, where you know Sybil keeps expecting him to be at home, and he keeps finding reasons to not go home. And when he does go home, he's either exhausted or something else happens and he has to leave again. And it doesn't criticise him probably as much as it could for these choices. Well, not at all. I mean, mm. there's that whole bit where she talks herself into feeling lucky about mm. how it is that he's not going off to war and getting himself killed. Like, he's at least still here. Well... Most days, every night anyway. Well, part of most nights, certainly. Like, you know, she's really qualifying it mm. to the nth degree to go, this is an okay relationship where he's consumed by his work. And he kind of, in this book, it's like the first time that he seems to at all change his attitude around that and spends a bit more time at home. But it's only because he's forced to, really, because mm. he's been injured. Mm. Um, and I, it made me very sad because, again, Sybil's not in the book very much. Mm. And you get this picture of that relationship, which is not great. Yeah. And in the end, again, not, not to jump ahead too much, but she goes to the patrician to bring this up and is put off her criticisms because they're going to promote Vimes. Yeah. And, and so she'll have something more to talk about when she catches up with the, the other establishment wives. Or at least mm. be quietly smug about yeah. not talking about yeah. it, which I thought was, yeah, that's very Sybil. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. But yeah, that, I found that a bit disappointing. I thought mm. she might have a bit more to do and say. I, I, I hadn't remembered that. But look, you know, we're getting to the sort of crux of the action. Where almost, everyone's on a boat. Where everyone's on a boat because... <laughs> Literally everyone. They've become fairly convinced that nothing good is going to happen. Rust has taken over in the patrician's absence. He basically deposes Vimes, says, you know, I'm standing you down because of all the nonsense that you've done. Like you've wrongly arrested people you went into the embassy without being asked you did this other thing and so he and uh, eventually most of the watch all hand in their badges and it's funny because he does a thing like oh you detained this family that that are clatchian also can you please go detain all the clatchian families yeah <laughs> rust is just full of contradictions you know he just sees everything in the way that will give him the most advantage in the situation and doesn't really worry about the truth which is Again, a very prescient kind of <laughs> depiction of a modern politician. And also the divide, again, between the broad strokes and the individual family. Oh, you can detain all of these people of a certain things, but you can't detain this one family because they've got a name. Like there's like, mm. yeah, it's that cognitive dissonance, which is not, I think, necessarily deliberate, but I think that's another mm. example of it yeah. there. But um, yeah, he, he's forgotten that Vimes is a fancy boy. Yeah, 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 he's a, he's a sir, uh, and he's allowed to raise an army just like all the other nobles are doing because Ankh-Morpork doesn't have a standing army, but the various lords of the city are raising their own regiments to take off to war, and they're all getting ready to depart. Including um, um, Butler Willikins. Um, Willikins <laughs> goes off to join, yes. He uses the one with the nicest uniform. <laughs> yeah. What's well, the gold frogging? Oh, the, the, <laughs> the red and the white in the desert. Yeah, that's right. Oh, man. Willikins, it's, it's, it's a nice... Uh, sort of a cameo really role for Willikins more than anything else, but it does set that precedent as someone I think on Twitter was saying that he is, he is a badass. Like yeah. he's, he's a bit Alfred, I think, 
like modern day depictions of Alfred as an ex-military man. It's like Mr. Butler um, and Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries. There are, there's like a history of um, kick-ass butlers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, when you've trained to have all of those skills, you train to have all of the skills. Mm. <laughs> and You can carve a turkey or like the a enemy. Person. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I quite enjoyed that. And that, you know, that comes back again later on in later books. Mm. But yeah, this is sort of where it begins, which is quite nice. But yeah, he, he forms his own regiment, which includes, of course, pretty much all of the, the watch. The watch. And uh, there's that also there's that meeting between the other brother, Prince Caliph and uh, Lord Rust, who are being very cordial towards each other in that they're about to all murder each other. Mm. <laughs> he's not, not a brother, is he? He's, the, he's a deputy. He? Uh, he's, a deputy. he's a prince, though, isn't he? So he might be a brother. It's hard to tell. He's I don't know that they specifically say. Yeah. Look, a lot of the Clatchins start to leave. They all get themselves on a boat. Before they're, like, rounded up, because that's the, the next thing. Yeah, they, they can see... They can see where things are going. Including the Garths. Yeah. And they're all on, uh, well, a lot of them are on one particular boat. And Angua decides to go check it out in her wolf well, form. Well, not for no reason. Like, they're pretty sure that 71 hour Ahmed is on board. Well, they know he's on board. With the prince. And, and they're like, oh, he's probably got the prince, so we can't let him get away. This is important. Um, so she sneaks on board, but 71 yeah. hour Ahmed's onto her. I wasn't entirely, I mean, I liked what we got about 71 hour Ahmed in this little bit, but I just wasn't entirely sure about how this plays in the plot. It just seemed an odd little cul-de-sac for Carrot and Angra to go down, and then it doesn't kind of go anywhere. Well, mm. I think later on Ahmed suggests this is part of his plan. Like he needed Vimes to follow him to Clutch. Yeah. And so this yeah. is how he did it. Like he sort of made sure that they knew he was going to be the guy. Because he was in the window as well, the boat. yeah. Yeah, and then he captures Angua when she sneaks on board so that they have no choice but to follow him. And this is where you know, Captain Jenkins comes back into the plot. They commandeer his boat, make him throw everything mm. overboard in an increasing <laughs> laundry list of things that would be great to have when you're out at sea but that they no longer possess. Things, you know, little things like anchors and lifeboats and mm. all that kind of stuff. That's Grappling come up and because he lied about... Losing things earlier on. Yeah. And there we go. I feel, I did feel from at that point of the book though. I'm like, it, it's hard to be a sailor when your boat is full of people who aren't sailors. But also he makes a nasty fat joke about Lady Sybil. So he deserves it. Well, that's true. He does, mm. which does not, does not get rebuffed. Yeah. He just I was, gets sort of frowned at. I thought that was a bit weird. I was like, oh, I was like, dude, it's your wife. Cause he says something and then that's not so bad. And then he makes the fat joke and Vimes is sort of like, mm, I was expecting it because more. Because he needs him to run the boat. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. I felt, I did feel that that was a bit weird. Yeah, that was mm. like the, like, and there could be other examples, but that was the one I noticed of a, a nasty comment that did, that went unchecked. Yeah. It. Yeah. 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 The other thing that does get a bit unchecked is that some of the descriptions of what Clatchins look like do draw on a bit of a caricature idea of what, you know, Middle Eastern people look like. Like they, they do use the phrase hooked nose in there and they talk about the beards, like everybody's got a beard and you're like, not great. I don't know. That and it's all over the cover. And that, it it yeah. is. Yeah, the Josh Kirby version of a clutch in is very much, it's not a million miles away from the kind of political cartoons you would have seen mm. in the 70s. Or now. Well, mm. yeah. Uh, oh, oh. Let's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, those things are fairly minor in this book, but they are there. I think it's important to acknowledge that. And as much as this does give some depth to the idea of clutch, it doesn't necessarily give a lot of breadth. Like, it, it's still drawing on those same cultural tropes and stereotypes. And there is a whole white saviour plot. Yeah. Although, I mean, I think you forgive that a little bit because it's Carrot and he's already yeah. been so established as the person that everyone will follow that mm. you don't see it so much as a white saviour thing. Also because of the way that that plot concludes. It doesn't end the same way as Lords of mm. Arabia. I feel like that needs to be given a nod to as well. That is a little, a little bit... Of what it, but yeah, I agree with but you. But yeah, no, you're right though. Like there is certainly an element of that. One of the things that maybe makes it feel less like that is that it is about averting a war that is going to happen. And so the white folks are already involved. And so the fact that the resolution involves them, not necessarily in a saviour capacity, but I mean, you know, also the villains of the piece are Clatchians, uh, as it turns out. So. Yeah. Uh, well, not all of them, but, you know, the, the sort of ultimate architects of the whole situation. Um, so there is there is that as well. So it's 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 complicated. 
Yeah, as in it's not terrible. Yeah, but I think also it's addressed, you know, in the book in a way, you know, when Ahmed and, and Vimes are talking about this, he says, you know, we, I knew you wouldn't want to see us as the enemy. You'd want to see it as one of your own people. But, you know, if you're going to allow us to be people and mm. realize that we're people, you've got to realize that we are also capable of being complete jerks. Yeah, you've got to allow us to be scheming bastards. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. Which I think nicely lampshades it because he has put heroes and villains on both sides, which I think mm. is important. I, I certainly think it could be better done and I'm, I'm aware of none of us are uh, of Middle Eastern descent, mm. so we might feel quite differently about the book. Um, but I think there's a lot of things that save it from being... Mm. Really gross. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't think you get to the ending and you think, oh, yeah, the Clatchians were the bad guys. No. No. And you think this guy was the bad guy and the Clatchians don't like him either. Well, I think you get this guy wanted to depose the other prince. But the the bad people, which is what comes across, is that, that in order for that to happen, they were preying on the the volatility, the the sort of ingrained racism in mm. the Yank Morporkins to just facilitate this. That yeah. They didn't really have to do much and then this just you know, took on a life of its own. Yeah. And that lands much more sort of severely than this guy trying to assassinate his brother. Yeah. No, I agree that to me the villain of it was societally condoned racism, to mm. put it in like a weirdly formal way. But like it was underlying attitudes that go unchecked was the bigger problem. Yeah. And these were just like ways of bringing it out. Yeah, that's fair. And I mean this is also, you know, it's a plot that you see in a lot of things where somebody's like, let's provoke somebody to attack us so that we all pull together against them instead of against each other. I mean, it's the plot of Watchmen, Watchmen. right? <laughs> you know, so it's it's not like it hasn't been done with a white Western context. So I, I think, yeah, just as, you know, everyone's sort of heading off to Clatch, the patrician has been preparing all this time while he's been vanished. He's been you know, plotting with Leonard of Quirm and he sends Leonard of Quirm, that's one of my favourite scenes in the book, <laughs> to find... <laughs> Fred and Nobby and kidnap them, Mm -hmm. but he's so bad at it. It's great. Like, he's invented the bazooka, essentially, and he tries to use it to hold them up. And uh, Nobby, of course, is very excited by this and sets it off and blows up some poor troll's house. But he just, he, like, hands it to them while he... While he's upgrading it. There's just... Oh, I just love that so much. That's why he's the ultimate good boy, Leonard of Quirm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He can't even hold people up when it's important. He's too distracted. He's too nice. He is also very nice. But he does manage to get them to come with him to the boat. So the opposite of what happened to, what is it, Nobby's uncle who got reverse shanghai Oh, yeah. And press ganged and found himself tied to a plow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he used to be a sailor. <laughs> that was great. Oh, that made me laugh too. <laughs> they get in the boat uh, and head off. And uh, the, you know, this, the boat. The, the boat, yeah. Yes. Yeah, what, it's got dust, a long dust name boot. Dust boot, yeah. as well. Oh like, yeah, because it's like it goes submarine level, yeah, and so, so it's called something. And so it's <laughs> called the going under the water safely device. <laughs> <laughs> because Leonard is not good at naming things. And I also love that they sort of they lure them in by saying, "Oh, you have unique qualities that we really need." When the unique qualities that they really need, uh, some people who are involved in the situation so know a little bit about it, but are generally very dumb and can provide a bit of muscle power. <laughs> That's, I'm like, that's great. That's perfect. Uh, and we'll do what they're told. So they, they kind of, yeah, I don't know. They fit the bill perfectly. And I just love that they're just all riding around in this like fart-filled submarine. That yeah. There's a constant <laughs> joke because he's only bought beans and cheese. He's had to do things quickly. And they can't go up for air until like, Nobby's like, Nobby's the one that's going out of his mind about it, which I found really funny. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was quite entertaining. They would be very <laughs> fart filled, though, wouldn't they? Oh, look, it wouldn't be a great time for lots of reasons. Being in a submarine <laughs> wasn't like I would not like to be in a submarine for any reason, but it's just that hadn't occurred to me. Mm. I mean, I'd like to be in one to see undersea animals. I was always obsessed with sea monsters and stuff when I was a kid and deep sea animals, and I I I think I enjoyed that part of this book. Although there's very little description. Apart from Fred, like, worrying about crabs waving at him and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, it is mistaken for a for a sea creature. Yeah. It, In a very so. uh, nautilus kind of way, mm. Jules Verne kind of way. Because they've got it's got the big um, corkscrew thing on the the screw on the front, the auger, which Fred's like, oh, you can use that to like drill holes in the sides of boats, which is exactly what the Nautilus does, <laughs> smashes holes in the side of boats. And Leonard's like, no, it could possibly, no one I mean, would do that. I mean, he could do that, but he wouldn't. It's just to attach yourself to a, a ship, so we don't have to, you know, um, pedal, pedal the whole way. 
which is what they do, which leads to the, the you know, unwittingly assisting in the escape of Angua, who's been chained up with Silver. And she has to overhear their conversation about farts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if she's not suffering enough with her silver collar. I know. <laughs> oh, it's such, it was such a good scene. I enjoyed that a lot. But her escape is also the first strong hint you get that Ahmed's not a villain. Yeah. Mm. Because once she gets out of the ship, he looks out and sees her, like, clinging to the side. And then he tells everyone else that she's drowned. And mm-hmm. you're like, why did you capture her if you're going to let her escape? Yeah, he sort of grins at her. Yeah, yeah. and you're like, interesting, interesting. Yeah. So you kind of know it's going somewhere, but you're not quite sure where. Yeah. He's I- such a good character. Like, mm-hmm. I wish he turned up m- more in later books. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's a good counterpart to Vimes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think there's there's certainly scope, would have been scope for that. But um, I don't know that we really go back to Clatch very much after this book. This is kind of the big Clatch book. Mm. And then, you know, there's characters from Clatch and there's references to it, but I don't think we ever go back there again. Mm. It's just this book in Sorcery. But look, it, it, they eventually get to the other side. The boat makes a detour to underneath Lesh. But they can't get it in fresh air. Yeah, uh, but then keeps going and they crash la- <laughs> they crash the ship that the watch is on. They're ostensibly still going after Angua. And this is where we also have uh, many discussions about Carrot's attitude and we revisit that idea that he doesn't think personal is the same as important. Mm. And so he's quite happy to have a nap while Angua needs to be saved because he's like, well, I've got to be fresh when we catch up to her there's no point in me staying up all night worrying and then being too tired to be any use when we actually very rational yeah it is he's one of those characters who you like characters. i get it <laughs> yeah uh, i get it but like emotionally i couldn't do that and vimes is on that he's like look you came and did the right thing by reporting to me but anyone else would have just dived onto that boat and tried to rescue her first i don't know it's an interesting aspect of his character this is why carrot is good king material i think because he can compartmentalize and he can see the bigger picture at all times. That's why his whole thing is personal is not the same it's as not important. The same as important, yeah. And I think that's his king thing coming through because that's not normal. That could be because I've just like watched all of the crown again. But <laughs> a whole big thing about that is putting aside your personal needs and your emotions in service of the greater good of the crown or and your responsibilities. But and he think- doesn't seem to have any difficulty doing it. I think that's the thing that's weird. No, but isn't that because he's just so inherently kingly right. that it's in his personality? Like, I don't think he feels like he should be doing this. He is like that because he's a born king. Right. Okay. So that, that's my interpretation of it. He just embodies all the qualities of a good monarch. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we only ever see him sort of through other characters' eyes. So that's true. We never really get much of an, an insight into him. And he's sort of then portrayed as this distinctly charismatic and odd individual who people just go along with and that will somehow make things better. Yeah. Um, and whether it's just, again, seeding the idea for, for everything that happens later with him. But because we are at a remove from him, it feels kind of unfeeling or uncaring. I think there's also those those moments in this book where Vimes has that sort of little glimmer of, can't quite sure if you really are entirely innocent over this or if you kind of know what you're doing when you're being a bit arch mm. Mm. and it's never revealed and he's and there's that bit where he says like inside his brain there's like a big steel door and i will never see the other side of that door mm. and you're like wow that is that's intense yeah you just don't know which way he's gonna go mm. and I, I don't remember much about carrots uh, evolution after this book and i think the next big one for him is um the fifth elephant mm. But I, I'm excited to find out. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I liked him a lot in The Fifth Elephant because I think it, it took him off this pedestal and made him feel more real in a way that, yeah, he hasn't really since the, the beginning. Yeah. He's always been a bit too good to be true. Mm. Yeah. Another ultimate good boy. <laughs> yeah. It's a book yeah. of good boys, yeah. but no gas boat. <laughs> gas boat, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, mm. too much, too much gas in the boat. Though you're right. Um, they, um, <laughs> they, uh, they get anyway. They get to the other side uh, of the Circle C. They arrive in Clatch. Um, the uh, the now the Watch end up in the Dunes and are almost immediately once they set off captured by a bunch of dregs who are the sort of 
desert nomad people. I was calling them D-regs. I think it's supposed to be pronounced dregs. Oh, this this was a, a, a weird rabbit hole that I fell into through through the L-space annotations, but yeah. where um, they talk about the dregs and then they refer you to an annotation for soul music, which sort of has nothing to do with this, but in that they talk about the French Foreign Legion because I think they talk about the Clatchin Foreign mm. Legion in that book. Yeah. Then Terry Pratchett talks about how he basically took all his ideas for that from Beaugest, this old film which was based on a book, and then in the book it's referring to, I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, but the Toregs, who were this sort of northern African nomadic tribe, and that seems to be the model for what he's pulling it off. Right. Um, but it was interesting because the Toregs were matrilineal and sort of revered the women as the kind of leaders in their culture, or well, do, not did, but... It was just, yeah, a really interesting sort of bit of history that he then pulled from this pop cultural thing that he ingested when he was younger and then put into these characters in this book. Mm. What happens next? While they're getting captured fairly clearly under the orders of 71 Hour Ahmed, because Vimes has taken his men off in a boat, this has had a bit of an effect because Lord Rust has gone, well, you can't start the invasion with one boat. Like, we all have to go. We've got to go immediately. And everybody goes from Angmorpork, even though they're not at all ready to invade another country, and they all uh, head off as well. And the Patrician and Nobby and Fred and Leonard have also arrived in the boat secretly. He sends them off to get some disguises and they try their time-honoured tactic of like waiting until two people who just happen to be the right size go past and pulling them into an alley and taking their clothes, which never fails, except, of course, it does fail for them. So they... It's a good book of disguises, though, isn't it? I know. It's and quite... Carrot and his Mr. Potato Head disguises, which oh, we just like breeze past. That was hilarious. <laughs> That's right, because he's got the false moustache on and it's way too small. Yeah. And then it, they're all for Mr. Spuddy Head. Yeah, no, doesn't the librarian literally <laughs> think he's a potato? I don't know, it's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> or he's making it. I can't tell if he's making a joke or if he's like, no, this is a potato. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's very funny. Uh, but, yeah, they end up with uh, some sort of travelling performer disguises and uh, get challenged almost immediately once they're wearing them because it, there's, there's sort of two uh, outfits that involve a fez. And then there's one that's like harem pants and um, metal bikini, which Nobby ends up wearing with hilarious It's a results. great footnote about that, about how it doesn't sort of trick someone into falling in love with him who's normally sane. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nobby can destroy narrative convention. <laughs> uh, yeah. Then there's that great scene where they get challenged early on because it says here on their sign that they're jugglers and the patrician just starts juggling. And he juggles like it's so bizarre, like seven melons, and then like four melons and three knives, and then he like explodes a melon, and then Fred's like, "I didn't know you could juggle, sir." He said, well, "Neither did I until today." And you're like, "What?" I feel like maybe it's his assassin training. Well, that's what I felt. I thought it was going to go the other way. That joke. I thought it was going to be, "How do you think I learned to like juggle all of the responsibilities of running eight more pork?" But instead, <laughs> it's just like, "Oh well, actual juggling is easy if you can do that." <laughs> it was a bit weird, but. Great. But it, it, it's weird because with the patrician, it's sort of the most we ever get of him and the most we get mm. of him in non-patrician mode. And he's so odd and so uncharacteristic. And we get, you know, this bit with the clowning around and then the donkey and the minaret bit. And it's, you know, I was just reading it thinking, what? where on earth are they going with this? What? Yeah. What is the whole... Well, I mean, I, I kind of felt it was like he doesn't have to deal with all the problems of Ankh Morpork, but he's still just by nature a genius problem solver. And you just do anything that he turns his mind to. So, I don't know. I liked it. But I, mm. I get where you're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. I, it was endlessly fun, but just odd. Really yeah. odd. Yeah. Maybe he's like one of those people who turns into a complete weirdo when he's on holiday. <laughs> like like he leaves like part of himself in the office. You yeah. think you know, that they're a good person to invite on your trip. And then when you get them there, they're just the worst. Yeah. And they won't stop doing magic tricks. Yeah. Oh, no. And they have Hawaiian shorts that mismatch their Hawaiian shirt. Um, yeah, but they have various misadventures in Clutch, and they're looking for something which they eventually find, but it takes a while. Would it, and, I, and look, you know, this is a point where I, I was like, I know he's here for a reason, but I don't know what it is. And like, because I, I understood why he visited Lesh, but I wasn't entirely sure why he was in Clutch, because he sort of does everything incognito. But then he seems to he seems to get what he's after. Was this a good mission that he's gone on? Did it seem like it makes sense? The donkey really threw me. I was kind of like, my brain doesn't want to read this. Like, I, <laughs> as in, it, got to, it was like three pages of it. And I was kind of like, I mean, it's a lot. 
it was, I don't know. It's probably because I like read it all in one sitting, like the whole book. And I was kind of like, I don't know if I have the brain power to absorb what's going on with this donkey situation. So I think maybe that was one step too far for me. But that's also probably my own fault for reading it all at once. It's it's a very elaborate setup for stealing a magic carpet. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> true. But it works. <laughs> also, yeah. like a how with the don- anyway. Well, what does he say? You just need to know which parts of the donkey want to get down the stairs and they're the bits you poke with a stick. Yeah. They have their misadventures. Um, Back in in the uh, drag or drag camp, uh, the the watch are sort of struggling. Um, I love, I I thought they might do more with detritus in this because I knew it was going to get cold in the Mm. desert because I, you know, I studied geography in high school, but the, but vibes is like, why is it getting so cold? That's not, why does that happen in a desert? And detritus does get smarter, but I, I was kind of expecting a bit more to come of that rather than just he's competent. Especially since they foreshadowed it earlier when he's like, I've never been to Clatch because it's too warm and I'll get stupid. And then Mm. vibes like, don't go to Clatch. So they've like set it up and then he's just kind of. I thought he would do something like genius level in the nighttime that would then set up something later well, on, and he doesn't really do that. Does he? Who's the one who like suggests like attacking at night as per the book? Like that gives them the advantage because they they know that they're being surrounded. Oh, yeah. I think it's carrot, isn't it? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, because yeah, he's read the whole book. Yeah, yeah, and he's like, yeah, well, let's like, do it now. He could have given him that to suggest, and that yeah. would have been like his genius level thing. But that would have been great. Yeah, but that was good strategy. Yeah, and I think it it is like that with. Aside from Carrot, all the rest of the watch, when they get there and when they all get together, they're just superfluous. They do a bit of fighting, but they're not really in the scene very much. No, that's true. But they're um, there to not die because like, you've got the disorganizer narrating how things have mm, been going, which I true. thought was a yeah. really good idea like for a plot device. Like, it was kind of cool. And I kind of enjoyed how subtle it was. Like it mm. wasn't there all the time. It was just there at the really important moments. It because ramps it, up when it needs to. Yeah, because it, it, we didn't mention this earlier, but when Vimes leaves to go off to Clatch, there's the trousers of time. And I think this might actually be the first time Terry uses that phrase in Discworld novel. But, you know, there's these two paths for him open up. And because he's already asked the disorganizer, you know, why should I have to tell you everything I've got to do? Can't you just figure it out? And it already has started to predict his appointments in advance using its advanced sort of knowledge of the superposition of waves and so on. But because of some mishap, he and the other Vimes from the other universe accidentally get the wrong disorganizers. So the other Vimes is getting presumably, which if you think about his story, makes his story even more tragic yeah. because all his friends are dying and he's, all these horrible things are happening and he's getting these notifications of what the other Vimes is up to in Clatch and going, oh, I've done the wrong thing. I should have gone. And like that's awful. Mm. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that in much detail until now, but now I'm upset about it. it, it, it yeah, it's a really great conceit, but I think because th- they never reflect on it, it doesn't hit the mark as as much as it could for the build up that it gets. There's that bit where well, I don't know. I I, I get what you mean. I, I, for mm. me, it was enough that Vimes sort of figures out that yeah. it sounds real, and so therefore it must be real somewhere, and he's sort of thinking about it when he's talking to them after they haven't died, but he's mm. thinking, but the, you died and you died. And you, you, we're all supposed to be dead. This like the worst Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Like you were dead and you were dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they attack the others who are encircling them and getting ready to attack them, fend them off. And then he finally sort of figures out that there's something about three days of hospitality, although this is when it's written tree dice is a bit like well that's a bit much yeah. that's a bit much Pratchett I uh, didn't like that that's yeah. getting a little bit shut up your face uh, for my liking but you know he works out there's got to be something about that this is why he's called 71 hour Ahmed and he figures out it's because you know he killed somebody before the three days of mandatory hospitality were up by one hour but also that he's told these people to keep them there and he demands to know where he is. And they won't tell him, but um, the guys leading them, Jabbar, will take him there with a blindfold on. And he takes him off to the remains of General Tacitus's, Tacticus's city. I always want to say, because I'm pretty sure the real world one is Tacitus or something. It's mm. not quite tactic. But the, the, the Discworld one is just Tacticus, which seems fair. But he meets up with him. And this is where he has that great revelation, which I, look, on rereading it, I did not remember this. I did not see it coming. But I found it immensely satisfying when Vimes says, oh, what's it like being a policeman in Clatch? Whatever the line is that he says to them when he sort of says, I've, I've figured you out. You're a policeman too. Mm. And I just, I, 
That was great. And then you have the argument between the two of them about their varying methods and what they've done in the pursuit of the law and the differences in the kind of beats that they have. Because he talks about how you've got a city, I've got like thousands of kilometers of desert. And you're like, yeah, well, that's, that's a whole big deal. Hmm. Yeah. And just jumping back a little bit, during that battle, Vimes finds himself fighting what turns out to be the Goroth boy who's been conscripted. Yeah, that's and, right. And it's just that heartbreaking scene where he's like, oh, Vindaloo, because like, he's, he's like saying his order mm. to show that it's him. Oh, uh, yeah. And that's kind of... And he's like, I didn't want to do this. I just sort of came out here and he's like, oh, yeah, sorry. That's that continuation of that storyline. I quite like where it ends up, which I guess we'll get to in a minute yeah. because it's not quite where you expect it to go. But I thought that was, again, personalising that story was really important. I mean, meanwhile... You know, Lord Rust is trying to command the assembled hordes of private armies from Make More Pork and giving them Gain the worst. Well, well, yeah, hard to do when he's giving them the worst possible orders you could possibly give and is surrounded by people who can see that but have no authority to do anything about it, which is just, yeah, that's, it's very Blackadder for me. Very Blackadder goes forth. Got rustic attitudes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to stop. I'm not. It's, no, you're not. Don't, I think of another one that's going to happen. Don't lie about that. I immediately backpedaled. Yeah. Good. Good. I, I thought there could be more fun with camels in this book, to be honest, given what we know from pyramids. Like I would have liked a camel perspective cutaway. Mm. I did like the, the Lawrence of Arabia thing where Ahmed tells Vimes, you know, how to make the camel stop. <laughs> and he quotes exactly the same line from Lawrence of Arabia, but it's the reverse. In Lawrence of Arabia, this is how to make him go. And so <laughs> if, you've, if you're in on it, you know the joke before it happens, but it's yeah. still hilarious when Vimes actually does it and then sort of bails up Ahmed about that whole thing. And he said, oh, well, I just thought you'd want to lead your soldiers into, into battle with you at the front. Yeah, and the <laughs> others would respect you yeah. <laughs> if you go faster. <laughs> yeah, that was, oh, yeah. Uh, but Ahmed does lay out basically everything that happened. Like the prince, Prince Kadram, he's trying to unite his people. He realizes the only thing that's going to make them unite is a war against somebody else. So he is the one who plotted to assassinate his own brother as a preamble for war with Ankh Morpork. And you got to wonder if he set that up before Leshba even rose, because that would be cause for war without even the land there. Because he's already on his way as well. Yeah. So it seems like, I mean, there's a, there's, now that I think about that, there's an element where the whole Lesp thing seems kind of a, a bit of a furphy, like it doesn't really seem to matter that much. I swung on opinion about Lesp as well because it was like gross, like you don't want to be on there. But yeah. they said it was also in a good strategic position. Yeah, for so strategic like, position for the war we are going to have over the thing that's in a strategic mm. position. But also, like, in general, like, is it a strategic position for trade? Like, is it good to just own that spot? Right. But, like, also, it had appeared out of water. Like, if you desperately wanted to have something there, you could build something there. Mm. So I wasn't sure whether it was, like, a comment on fighting over something garbage or it's, or not. Like, it was undercut by it being a good yeah. strategic position. I, d- I don't know if the – because the strategic position needs to be, like, a later justification because it all goes back to, the like, the opening scene in the novel where you got the conflicting fishermen – um, yeah, it's just halfway both. between them and they both want it. And they both it. want it. Which is like, we want yeah. it because it's there and we don't want someone else to have it. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it's terrible. Yeah. And it's an excuse for those existing prejudices to bubble to the surface. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, his plan would have worked without it, but it probably works for better. For those meddling kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so maybe he only hatched the plan after that. There's a few weeks pass, or a week or two at least, between the original Rising of the City and the next part of the book. So that could easily be enough time for him to go, aha, this is my chance. I'll mm. put my plan into action. Well, they're very advanced. Like maybe he he knows when it's going to rise and fall. Oh, no, that, well, that wasn't clearly, work then. Yeah, no, he doesn't know that. He so. doesn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but I see what you mean. So, yeah, that's but he's the one, you know, he, he organized it. But also a lot of the false evidence was made more false <laughs> by, <laughs> by Ahmed who – planted some of it when breaking in. He figured out who the real assassin was uh, or the real killer. And because this is the way he does the law, he didn't just arrest him. He executed him by cutting his head off. And got his confession. And got his confession first in writing, which is why he took a couple of the pages off the pad, but left the pad there because he wanted Vimes to be intrigued and be following, Mm. Mm. which kind of makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because it's a satisfying plot, but it's not particularly... It's fairly straightforward, really. 
I think, once you get to the end of it. Yeah, it, I think it's the way with all of these storylines, not you know, not just this one, but storylines in general that trade in that kind of delayed mystery where you know that they're withholding something and you're, you're consciously aware that they are withholding. Yeah. And it means that when you get the thing, it better be worth it because if it's not, then you're like, well, okay, that's interesting. And it, and it does kind of change my opinion of everything I've seen, but I can't re-experience the story now. Yeah. <laughs> Star Wars. <clears throat> <Yes>. <laughs> It's not as satisfying as, say, the mystery and feet of clay, which you know we recently read, mm. and uh, which is a great how done it, mm. and which has a really satisfying conclusion. Whereas I felt like this this was good, but it wasn't like mind blowing. Mm. But there's a lot of nice little nuances to it, like because when you think back, knowing what you know now, you think back to the scene of the fire where there's the people bringing the paper, and he's like pushing people's paper out of their hands and going, "I can't believe you're throwing saving things on the fire," and that was like his excuse to steal the evidence that Kadram has sent this order for his brother to be killed or attacked at least. Well, it's not clear if he intended for his brother to die or not. I, I wasn't 100% sure on that. It was strange because it was kind of like Archduke Franz Ferdinand, but not quite because it was mm. like a weird middle ground between that and JFK. Mm. And so JFK didn't catalyze a war. No. And because he didn't die and the war was sort of already on train anyway, it was... a a bit odd an excuse to but me. i mean it was the excuse like why they send someone from clutch to say we're officially declaring war so it does mm. it does sort of pan out but at the same time yeah there's a lot of moving parts there and i mean that's one of the joys of pratchett usually is that he because he's writing a fictional history it is a fantasy world he can mash up whatever history he wants into mm. a new version and draw on all kinds of influences from across history and it's usually really satisfying. I think in this one it is maybe a little bit more confusing or at least not as satisfying as in other books. I found the foreshadowing of things very satisfying though because you look back and be like, oh, no, he planted the seed for that. Yeah. There. Whereas oh, that's, that's not sure. always the case in his books. Like I always find them good, but I thought this one felt very tidy, mm. which was, is pleasing. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think it's more for me that the kind of what you're saying, Craig, that the, some of the historical stuff, or, or what you're saying, is about how whether it's JFK or Duke Ferdinand, that's a bit muddied. Uh, but I, I agree that the sort of mystery aspects are very satisfying. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Any book that references the Mary Rose as well has got my vote. <laughs> <laughs> but look, even though this is true and they know this, uh, there's still something that's got to be done about it. Um, and so they head back to the war camp where the war is about to kick off. You know, for real. I mean, there's been there have been some skirmishes and some people have been fighting. Willikin's regiment, um, who turns up at about this point, have already been in a skirmish with a patrol. And he is terrifying. I know. He's bitten off someone's nose just before. <laughs> yeah. He's that, like screaming and just, yeah. He's just sort of giving out orders and telling them, this guy's dead. Like, you grab that shovel and dig a hole for him. And he's just sort of very matter-of-factly telling Vimes who these men are who get killed when they attack. And that's quite a sobering moment in the book, I thought. Yeah. Mm. Willikin's like cutting loose in this, like unveiling. Like, is this like the real him or an aspect of him that's usually suppressed? Because I'm wondering if this is just like he's been so suppressed that now he's letting it all out, or if back in Ankh Morpork he has this side that gets let out in little bursts. Like, is he like the guy who plays computer games purely to scream at the other team for being noobs? Like, is that. Oh, like not I, not no. for the joy of playing, but to abuse the other team. No, I don't. I don't think so. He, uh, d- he does sign up awfully quick. He does sign up awfully quick, but I think that's because he genuinely feels that sense of duty. I think he's look. My read on him is that he's a very by the book person, uh, not just about being a butler, but by everything else. So when there's a call for a gentleman to sign up to fight for Angmore Pork, he feels like it's his duty to go, and so he does it. He says, "Sir, I must do it," because um, he always does what he thinks is right and. And, and best but he has a very rigid view on that and that includes like now that i'm in the army i have to fulfill that role which means i will fight and i will kill the enemy um, but i also throw orders at my fellow men and i will do that because it's right not because he necessarily enjoys it but because that's what's required of him and i don't know if that's the right way to read him but so he's not like on an ice hockey team at home where he like, no, gets this aggression out there i, I just feel so. changes gear yeah, I think I think maybe it's in him somewhere, but it doesn't have to come out. 
but he feels this is when it needs to come out because it's appropriate. I don't know that. I don't, maybe that's a weird way to think. Maybe about he aggressively him. prunes the. Re- I don't know. Like I feel like he needs something though to let because like I don't think that can just simmer beneath the surface for years on end without some kind of outlet, even if it's a constructive, not overtly aggressive one. I just wonder. Mm. If there's a way, he lets mm. that out. Back well, on. he will in later books. So, <laughs> but maybe that's because the bottle's uncorked. There yeah, is maybe, another, so like maybe this is him discovering it. Maybe he didn't know. Got it was his there. taste. Yeah, I don't know. Taste for noses. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! And they made that good joke in there as well. It was like it wasn't like he's hungry or something. It's like it's been a long time between noses. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's a good call. <laughs> Uh, and he laughs at that. He goes, ah, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> And you're like, yep, that says Wilkins is definitely still there. But they head back to the camp where the leaders of the two forces are about to meet with everybody in tow and accuse the prince of conspiracy to well, murder. They arrest him and they, they arrest, arrest their him. armies. And they arrest everybody. <laughs> yeah. And no one ever says this isn't your jurisdiction vibes, which I was expecting someone to say. But I guess because it's him and Ahmed there, it's it, it does they mm. they do have the jurisdiction because it's both of them together. It's a buddy cop film. Yeah, well, I think I think he he in his sort of internal monologue, he knows that he doesn't. He he knows yeah. that he's miles away, but he's like, I'm all in now. I just need to kind of commit to this and yeah. see what happens. Yeah, and the. Donning of Stoneface throughout the book, because like, we haven't talked about that, but this scene in particular, I think, because he's faced with a crossroads of an idea, because mm. um, and then comes back later. It's just it's kind of good that he's thinking mm. about his relative who was put in a similar situation to a degree where there was like a monarch that was out of line. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair, and I, I think uh, I, I do like the way they introduce Stoneface too. We didn't mention this at the start, but mm. during that first meeting of all the nobles where somebody makes an offhand comment about Stoneface without mentioning him by name, and Vimes just sort of looks up brightly and says, oh, you mean my ancestor, Stoneface Vimes, who cut off the head of the king, just sort of says, is that what you're referring to obliquely? (laughs) And everyone's like, oh, we're too embarrassed to talk about it now. (laughs) You're like, yeah, okay. He has no shame about that. We can't really bring that up. Because he was doing the right thing. (laughs) Well, he was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. The war all seems to be more or less halted, with everybody being arrested, but it's not really officially over until the patrician shows up on his flying carpet in order to offer the surrender of Angmore Pork, which outrages Lord Russ, but suits Prince Cadram. Um, but, well, it just doesn't really suit him, does it? Because he doesn't get the war he was after. But at the same time, it kind of suits him because he can now tell everyone that he's won this great victory and he can use that as like a bargaining to pull all his people together. So he's sort of trying to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat or indeed defeat from the jaws of victory so it all kind of comes together but the lords are angry about this like you can't do this you're not even technically in charge he's like well i just did though um and we're gonna sign it and it's all gonna be fine but we'll we'll ratify it we'll do it on lesh and we'll do it uh, in a couple of days time great okay we're gonna take you home if you're even in charge by then and so they'll go back to ank morpork all of the ank morporkians and uh they do decide they're gonna have words with the patrician. He's going to be tried for treason or something similar. And he's led to the palace in handcuffs by, by Viams and co. Uh, once they get back. And it doesn't go quite the way anybody expects because Lesh vanishes beneath the sea again. So they can't meet there to ratify it. And so it's not going to get signed. Which means the whole war has been averted and they haven't really lost anything. They lost a football game. Oh, he did mm. lose a football game. That's true. Well, no, because Cl- Clash lost the football game on penalties. If I remember, well, they, right. but they won on fouls. I think. Did they? They committed more fouls. Oh, the yeah. so. <laughs> well, that, that is that is a point scoring system all its yeah. own. It was nice to be reminded that football was a thing yeah. in the disc world before we have the book about it, which I'd forgotten. Um, but yeah, that was that was fun. Although this seems much more to be soccer. Mm. Uh, football rather than rugby, which mm. is what. Well, I guess it's it's harkening back to the that the soccer game that was played in World War One, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, that yeah. The one on Christmas Day, wasn't mm. it? Yeah, the Christmas Day. I was just um, yeah. with, with a you know a dose of Lawrence of Arabia thrown in. So yeah, kind of, <laughs> just, just mix it all yeah. up in there. And I mean, look, Carrots Lawrence of Arabia stuff is is kind of fine, but also I don't know. I felt I feel kind of. In some ways, a little unnecessary. Like, I, I guess if you were going to get everybody to pull together and, and work together in that last scene, you needed somebody to convince them that was a good idea. 
but it also just seemed in their best interest. So I don't really know that you needed a magical Lawrence of Arabia figure. To no, but it, it, it doesn't work though, because it, in some ways it does descend into the same chaos that the end of, I guess, Lawrence of Arabia, the film did where mm. there's no unified Arabia in the film. They're all fighting amongst themselves. And, and Carrick talks about how the different tribes are just leaving because they yeah. didn't really sign up for the war in a sense. They were there for other reasons that weren't kind of followed through on. So, the idea of this white saviour person unifying everyone just doesn't hold hold out. Yeah. And then it, the patrician says to Vimes, you know, and again it's it's almost directly quoting the film where he sort of says, you know, your your time, yeah, I think he calls him an action man or something, it's, it's finished now is the time for me to sort things out and for diplomacy basically. Yeah. 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 So Vimes' role really was just to hold off things mm. until that deal could be sealed, which, you know, does happen. And then we have the sort of the coda of the book. We have the, the, the epilogue bits where after everything is sorted out, there's a few things to, to go through. We have the end of the Goroff storyline where um, Sun says, oh, you've set a great example. Oh, he's going to be a watchman. Mm. They're like, oh, great. Yeah, just come along and join up. Like, no, he's going to be a watchman back in Clatch, which I thought was a nice touch. Well, and, and Colin thinks that they've been rude because they just kind of go inside when he comes along, but then they... They what, bring him some so food. They come yeah. out with the food, yeah, yeah. 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 But they, and they talk about the um, the pub with the the wooden head on it, and yeah. they decide not to go in there anymore. It wasn't very good. Yeah, a terrible beer anyway. Hmm. Yeah, uh, and Vimes gets another promotion. <laughs> It's like a punishment. Um, for it's, 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 it's sort of not described as a promotion. It's, it's, he says, I'm going to you know, change your title. He doesn't sort of say, I'm going to make you more important. But, of course, he yeah. is because now he's a duke. And Sybil's a duchess. Yeah. So they, they're they going to revive the Vimes coat of arms and they're going to revise the history books and build a statue to stone face Vimes, which I thought I'd totally forgotten I'd this forgotten happened. I forgot too, yeah. yeah. I thought that was great. I was like, really? And out of the wind. <laughs> is, like that gonna, nice spot. is that really going to win him over? I'm like, oh, it is. Yeah. That's but I also I- thought that the other thing that was going to happen was that Sybil would get her way when she comes along and that he would insist on there being like a more of a command structure below him so he didn't have to do everything himself. But that doesn't really well, what, what's, happen. Is the fifth elephant next? Yeah. Because I guess it does play out in that where she goes along with him mm. in that story, supposedly, which is just meant to be a bit of diplomacy. He's meant to then go as a like an ambassador or something. Yeah, yeah. And so she comes along to do ambassadorial wifey <laughs> duties and then it turns into something else. So I yeah. guess it... Kind of happens. It flows on from there. Yeah, yeah. it's an interesting one because I think there's, yeah, it'll be nice to, I'm looking forward to that because I'm looking forward to more Sybil because, mm. yeah, this, just this one and the, the last few, well, basically all the books in between since Guards Guards just haven't had enough Sybil in them, really. Yeah, she's been very much a cameo. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Which is sad considering how interesting a character she is. And also I would like to see more Swamp Dragons. Mm. Yeah. More camel jokes and more swamp dragons. Yeah, not enough camel jokes and swamp dragons, I agree. I just wanted a camel perspective at one point because that was just... <laughs> I thought we were going to get one because yeah. we got a little bit more about the camel in this one. Because there's a joke about like, that really, like, ca- carrots riding the difficult camel as well and I thought we'd get like an inner monologue from from this one. Yeah, what does the camel think of this carrot guy? Like, is he working out the maths on how to fling him off but actually, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are there any other final thoughts before we move on to our favourite... Do, lines and quotes. Do we want to touch Nobby and his little... No, we don't oh, want to touch yes. Nobby. No, yes. I think we should talk about it, though, <laughs> yeah. because he has that whole the whole thing where he has the fortune telling about his future and she sees him with a bunch of nubiles, <laughs> which he begins, suspects is like some sort of country. And then, yes, it's because he's dressed up as one of them. Mm. How, yeah. do we, how do we feel that's handled? It was fine. Like, he... It's that thing where you can't understand a thing until you've experienced it yourself. But I thought it was a kind of a, a nice add-on. It wasn't necessary. I liked that it wasn't just a thing where it was Nobby dressed up as a woman and that was his storyline, but that for a long time, even after that, it was said Betty in yeah. in the text. Like he was, yeah. he had adopted this persona and this was the character now. It'd be interesting to see how that would have been written now. Cause, yeah. Cause it almost it felt like it was almost there, but... Not quite. I thought it was a good way also to show what was happening in Clatch and the social, imp- like, like how people were going off to this war, how the women were being left behind. Just again, it was a glimpse into personal impact, mm. which I don't know would have been able to be done 
as succinctly mm. without that storyline. Because mm. it yeah. embedded him in some family. Yeah, I guess, I mean, there's perhaps a question about whether it would have been better to have one of the actual female characters yeah. go and fulfill that role. But it also seems to fit into a larger kind of storyline thing that Pratchett wants to do with Nobby in this book of him trying to find someone. And yeah. He's evolving. And I think this sort of helps with that. But it's like, it's not seamless. No. But mm. I think the sentiment is good. Mm. Yeah. It would have been interesting for Cheery to be yeah. witness to this. Given, you know, Nobby just puts on the clothes and suddenly he looks like a woman, whereas she needs to go to great lengths to be just accepted as a woman. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that is quite an interesting contrast. And she is such an interesting character in the feet of clay, mm. but in in this book everyone's just accepted. Oh, she's just a, she's mm. a woman, she's a dwarf, she's a watchman, she's all of those things, which is which is great, but also there's no commentary on it really in this mm. And she doesn't really do anything <laughs> except look a bit bashful. And there's that one bit where Vimes is like describing what he thinks the perpetrator of the crime looks like. Yeah. And she's like, but taken aback <laughs> by his CSI level of uh, yeah. knowledge, which is entirely because he's met the person. I thought that was great. As you say, detectoring is like gambling. The secret is to know the winner in advance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a good line. Uh, I enjoyed that a lot. Mm. All right, well, um, what about favourite bits? Do you have any favourite lines or footnotes? I don't know if I, as in I have a few, but this is one that I particularly enjoyed in the section where they were talking about why they keep rejecting having a printing press and the wizard saying that supposing someone printed a book on magic and they broke up the type again and used it for a book on, say, cookery. Uh, so, And I was kind of like, someone did do that to a degree because you've got, um, was it Nanny Ogg's Salacious Magical <laughs> Cookery Book? <laughs> Well, is it's it not, magical? No, but, isn't, but it is kind of because like, the impact it has on well, people true. is almost, as in like I know it's not exactly the same, but I was like, is that a nod to that? And that is something that came of having a printing press, like a dangerous cookery well, book came out. I did enjoy the, and you mentioned it earlier um, with the nephew, hmm. but, but the uh, how that comes from the footnote after where he talks about a Pavlovian response. And you can see how it clearly, there's no way I can come up with a Discworld equivalent of Pavlovian response. So let's just keep it as Pavlovian and then say that it was a term invented by the wizard's nephew boot who'd found that by a system of rewards and punishments, he could train a dog at the ringing of a bell to immediately eat a strawberry meringue. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, I like that a lot. That the was very funny. is just so good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's a good it's a good rule of thumb in comedy. The more specific you are, the more funny it will be. I enjoyed that there's a couple of little things in this book. It's not so much that I enjoyed because they were funny because they're kind of like little precursors to what would come later in the books. Mm. There's a passage where Pratchett refers to the monstrous regiment of Watchmen mm. just because there's so many different kinds of being in the watch at that point. I quite enjoyed that. I really liked, oh, this was one of my favorite gags. It's just just a little aside by Leonard of Quirm when they're talking about the floating up of Leshp and the sinking of it again. It puts me in mind, said Leonard, of those nautical stories about giant turtles that sleep on the surface, thus causing sailors to think they are an island. Of course, you don't get giant turtles that small. <laughs> it's such a, a joke you can only do on the disc worlds. Uh, I loved it. I really enjoyed the footnote that was quite straightforward and good advice. One of the universal rules of happiness is always be wary of any helpful item that weighs less than its operating manual. <laughs> yeah. It's good advice. There's a great description about the night desert and they, they make a, a reference earlier in the book to how this is where religions come from in deserts. And it's, it's a thing that's in small gods as well. But I particularly like this passage that sums it up. Night poured over the desert. It came suddenly in purple. In the clear air, the stars drilled down out of the sky, reminding any thoughtful watcher that it is in the deserts and high places that religions are generated. When men see nothing but bottomless infinity over their heads, they have always had a driving and desperate urge to find someone to put in the way. <laughs> I thought, I like that. That's, mm. that's lovely. My favourite bit in the book, which isn't particularly funny, but it really stood out for me, mainly because it just seems now. doesn't seem like it was written 22 years ago, but I guess that's the point. Where Vimes is trying to wrestle with all the conflicting clues and he's trying to wrestle with what he thinks is going on and who's to blame and is coming up against, I guess, the limitations of his own thinking and his own bias, where he says, and then he realised why he was thinking like this. 
It was because he wanted there to be conspirators. It was much better to imagine men in some smoky room somewhere, made mad and cynical by privilege and power, plotting over brandy. You had to cling to this sort of image because if you didn't, then you might have to face the fact that bad things happened because ordinary people, the kind who brushed the dog and told their children bedtime stories, were capable of then going out and doing horrible things to other ordinary people. It was so much easier to blame it on them. It was bleakly depressing to think that they were us. If it was them, then nothing was anyone's fault. If it was us, then what did that make me? After all, I'm one of us. I must be. I've certainly never thought of myself as one of them. No one ever thinks of themselves as one of them. We're always one of us. It's them that do the bad things. And that just seemed pretty perfect in terms of encapsulating the novel, but I don't, everything at this point in time, it, you know, we, we cling on to the idea of, you know, there being some grand sinister mystery and that it's easy to otherize people who are to blame rather than thinking it's just another person. And, and even mm. more difficult to look at ourselves and mm. see how we are complicit in all the various things that are wrong in mm. our culture, you know, that we don't like about it and really question, well, what part do I play in it? And that is that is a really difficult thing to do. Mm. Um, and it, But, you know, it's also it's a lot more difficult than just deciding it's somebody else's problem or someone else's fault. Is it also elaborating on a line from an earlier book about, I can't, I can't remember which book or exactly the line, but something about like people go into offices and drink their coffee or like, and they go home and they do like, there was. Oh yeah. The, yeah. There's again in small gods, I think they talk about the torturers. Yeah. That's who work it. for the Omnian church and yeah, that they just are regular folks, but that's their day job. Cause it feels like an expansion on that. Like, mm, yeah, it's a very similar idea. Yeah. Mm. Now, look, as, as is always the case, we could have quoted so much of this book. There's so many good bits. But uh, we'll move on now to some questions from listeners. So, Liz, what have you got for us? So, this one's from Twitter, from Caro. What part destroyed you the most? I think the most famous part is a passage about us and them. But on this reread, the whole storyline about the Goris and the fleeing Catchians was just devastating. Mm-hmm. So, that was actually very well timed. Considering, yeah. 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 Mm. But I think, yeah, I mean, the the one passage pretty much defines the other one as well. But yeah, the Gaurav's through line, as you were saying, was just, I had not remembered that at all, but it was very well done. Yeah, I think those are the two most affecting for me too. I think one of the most affecting ones for me that surprised me in how affecting it was, was having him have those rem- like notifications about everyone dying in the other. Oh, yeah. Because you can, cause for me, I could imagine... That storyline, I was kind of like picturing that reality as well. And it's characters you love and care about. And mm. it was just strangely upsetting. As in that's not profoundly affecting on, on a deeper message of the novel mm. way. But for me, that was as a fan of Discworld and of the characters, I found that upsetting because it's like people you know. So it, like, it seems sort of almost thematically leading into where he goes with Nightwatch in that, you know, that, that different perspective on it different time when people that you care about are lost and being able to sort of reflect on that Mm. yeah it just seemed kind of almost like he'd given himself an idea with that and then had run with it in a slightly different way later on Mm. this one's from a chew and sneezed who also offered some really great commentary on the book um i may have asked this one before but who would you cast as sybil if we were being true to the books i always picture her as a posh valkyrie without the armor yeah (laughs) That is a good question. I think we may have previously considered this in the Guards Guards episode. Now she's probably a bit old for the part, but Dawn French would have been amazing as mm. as Lady Sybil. I mean, she'd be amazing now, but I think you know you would cast her a bit younger. Or, or, or would you? Would you? No, I think Dawn French now could still do a yeah, maybe solid job, maybe. So yeah, so she could be great. I don't know if I. I can't think of anyone else off the top of my head. Now that you've incepted that, that's all I can picture. I know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I always imagine someone taller than uh, Miranda Hart. Oh. I always thought, you know, had the, yeah, just that stature where she was. Miranda Hart would be amazing. Yeah. Or, or Gwendolyn from, like, I've forgotten her last name, but Gwendolyn you're from. Christine, Christine, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. different kind of. Very different kind of yeah. Lady Simmel. They'd all be great. All right. No, I'm, I'm sold on all of them. <laughs> I mean, they're not who we've got. Uh, in the watch, but the watch seems to be going for something very different. So I'm going to wait and see. I'm going to mm. wait and see. This one from Des. It's only four books and three years on from interesting times, but the attitudes towards racial differences seem discworlds apart. How do you think this book holds up compared? So we've touched on that a little bit, but mm. 
why I think there's not a critique of clutch in society as a whole. Like it's not held up and said, there's something wrong with you. Mm. And while it is still a bit of a mashup of various cultures in a way, it's largely middle, you know, it's kind of generic Middle Eastern, but that's kind of explained by the facts that it's meant to be a mashup of various cultures in the book. Whereas mm. the Agatian empire is one culture and it's very much meant to be a monoculture but it's drawn from a whole bunch of sort of Pan-Asian stereotypes and you've got bits of mostly Japan and China in there, which is a bit weird and gross, particularly when you consider the history of Japan Mm. and China and they would not like that. Mm. Um, So, yeah, I think think there's that difference for sure. And we don't get that deep into their culture either. They're just sort of... The the whole thing is about how the... the more Porkians think of them as the other, but then as soon as we get to know them in any depth, we realise, oh, they're just the same as us, really, with some different cultural business. Like, they're not deeply... There's, yeah, there's nothing wrong mm. with them. That's, that's not what the book is trying to say. So I think there's that. You're seeing both sides, I think, mm. but to a greater depth. Like you said. That's just me summarising what you said, but... And, yeah, and there's also there's a lot... I mean, because... And we touched on the, the white saviour thing, which is present a bit with Carrot, but it's not really... They're not really saved by mm. him. Like they're saved by the actions of the patrician and Vimes and 71 hour Ahmed is a big part mm. of it as well. And the dregs. And like, so there's this whole, like everybody sort of is needed for that solution. Whereas in interesting times, it's all down to Cohen and the barbarians and Rincewind. Mm. If they weren't there, it would all go horribly wrong. The thing that abides for me in, in Pratchett's books, particularly with. Vimes and a bit with Granny Weatherwax is this almost kind of simmering frustration or anger at things that are wrong in the world and whether it's like an injustice or, or, you know, racism and unjustified reasons for taking out violence against somebody like in this book. And he sort of tries to wrestle with that frustration or that anger through the story and there definitely seems to be an attempt to do that here and in the book's at this point and sort of onwards where it's less about encountering a great big dragon or something entirely uh, mystical and much more about what are the stupid, bad, annoying, awful, horrible things that people do and how can we try and find a way through this through a story. Mm. And that, mm. yeah, that seems to be emblematic in, in Jingo that isn't around in, say, interesting times. All right, so we did get quite a few questions, but I think maybe we'll just have time for one more from Sven Ackerman. Would you rather dive with Nobby or shower with Rid Cully? <laughs> um, <laughs> these are some of the most absurd inventions, so fitting that they are now back-to-back the most amazing adventures of this world. Look, I've always wanted to go on a submarine, <laughs> even a slightly leaky one, and it seems safe enough as long as you take the right provisions. Not baked beans. Yeah. yeah. Oof. I just, as in, like, I have a thing, like, I don't think I'd ever get in a helicopter and I don't want to get into a submarine for similar reasons of the lack of ability to escape. And, like, it's just, if it fails, it fails. But I also very much trust Leonard of Quorum. Mm -hmm. So if it was, like, a Leonard of Quorum submarine, maybe I'd do it. Much more than B.S. Johnson, that's for sure. (laughs) Wouldn't get in his submarine. But, I mean, I feel like it would be safer to shower with Rid Cully and also it probably wouldn't be weird because he probably, like, is one of those, like, Right, boys, we shower after football and <laughs> move on with our lives, sort of yeah, showers, okay. like mm. of which I've had exactly zero in my life because I don't play football. Look, they're, they're not as great as you might think. I don't think they're great. I just think that <laughs> it wouldn't be weird. Like, it could be like, yeah. Like if you're showering with the bursar, for example. <laughs> he wouldn't even know you were there. And, if, and that would be weird. Okay, yeah, that's fair. That would be weird. <laughs> <laughs> that would be weird. So like, if I had to choose... One of the wizards to have a shower with. <laughs> yeah, okay. Fair, fair. <laughs> fair. At least you know he's clean. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, I think that brings us to the end rather unexpectedly. Craig, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. If people want to find more of your writing or any of your writing online, is there somewhere they can go? Where would they find you? Probably through my Twitter account, which is at underscore Craig HB. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. remember that. Okay. That's good. That's good work. Yes. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to remember yes. your own Twitter handle. You don't you don't ever need to type it. It's true. Thank you, everyone. This is our, our third year now. It's it's January twenty twenty, Liz. Oof. I know we're recording this before the new year happens, so it feels weird to talk about the future. But it will be. It will be. 
But we'd like to say a big thank you to all of you who listen to the podcast, who subscribe, to anyone who supported us either by subscribing monetarily, by reviewing us on your podcast directory of choice, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever it might be. That all helps people find us because it's really worth doing when we know there's people out there listening. And of course, we'll be back. We'll be back every month until we've read every single one of Terry Pratchett's books. And next month, we'll be back with an old favorite of mine that I actually have to confess, I'm not sure I'm going to enjoy as much on the second read through, but I'm keen to give it a go. Because what are we reading, Liz? Well, only you can save mankind. I mean, it's true, but it's also the book that we will be <laughs> reading next time. Feels like that's the lesson we learned in Jingo, actually. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's what we're reading next time. So get it out, have a read through one of Terry's standalone. Well, it is. it started out as a standalone book. And in fact, all three in the series are standalone books. But it's one of the Johnny Maxwell books for younger readers. So I'm looking forward to that. It was a big favorite when I first read it. And I haven't read it at all. So I'm looking forward to finding out what exactly, it, who is Johnny Maxwell? Is he going to save mankind? Is he the you that they're talking about? Or is he the one giving the mission? Like, who knows? I, I mean, Ben knows. But, I do. I won't people, spoil it for yeah. you. But I'll find out. You will. You will find out. And until next time, please just remember, curry should not have sultanas in. You've been listening to Pratchett, the monthly Terry Pratchett book club podcast with Pratchatters Elizabeth Flux, Ben McKenzie, that's me, and guest Craig Hildebrand Burke. Pratchat is produced and edited by me, with music by David Ashton of Sample and Hold Studios. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pratchat Podcast, and listen to past episodes and support the production of new ones via PratchatPodcast.com. Join the conversation for this episode using the hashtag Pratchat27. Pratchat is brought to you by Splendid Chaps Productions. We make entertainment for your ears, like the Doctor Who podcast Splendid Chaps and time travel comedy series Night Terrace. To find out more, visit SplendidChaps.com.